Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs. We hope you're keeping very safe and well. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're listening to the show for the very first time, and where have you been, my God? And you can find us on iTunes, on Spotify, on Audio Boom, or across a range of different social media platforms. We're, of course, on Twitter, at Last Word on Spurs. We're on Facebook and Instagram, too. And I can tell, judging by the comments here, very, very lively bunch already. We are also live on YouTube. And listen, on games like today, you don't mind being live on YouTube. And I'm joined by three great guests. We've got our returning guest first up. Listen, she needs no introduction on this show. Always, I say, ready to give her opinions. But it's great to actually have her opinions on the back of a Spurs win. So I'd like to welcome back to the last one on Spurs. We've got Talia Corrin joining us. Talia, how are you? Thanks for having me, Ricky, as always. I am good, thank you. All good. And like you said, I think we always say this now. I think I have actually made it to quite a few wins. But every time we always think we lose because it gets so spirally into some mad spiral of negativity. But today I think we'll be like predominantly positive, which is good. Oh, I mean, some of the comments here, I say there's Jack on the screen there. We're winning the bloody league. I mean, that's that's the confidence of what a 3-0 win against uh, Norwich City does after you've beaten Brentford during a week. You can't make it up. That Spurs all over, isn't it? The excitement's back again. Um, As I said, we're welcoming two debutants to the last one on Spurs. First up, I've been trying for the last 15 minutes on the brain to not get this surname wrong. So here we go. Uh, Delighted to welcome Football London's on the Spurs side, one of their newest journalists, a massive Spurs fan. Obviously, alongside the likes of Rob Guesty, uh, Alistair Gar, we're welcoming a debutant in Emma De Duve to the show. Emma, did I nail that? And how are you? <laughs> you did nail it. Um, I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Glad to be making my debut after a Tottenham win. And as Talia said, hopefully, mostly positive. Oh, yeah. I, I say, I mean, I've been told tonight, listen, I've got to be positive about Ben Davis. You know, I've been, I've been told I've been hammered already. If I'm not positive about Ben Davis, uh, where does this show absolutely go? So also delighted to be welcoming to the show. Um, I've loved his opinions. actually been following him for quite a while now. Um, so pleased to welcome to the last one on Spurs, making his debut, George Bannister joins us. George, lovely to have you here. How are you? Very well. Thank you very much for having me on. It's, uh, as, as the others have said, great to be off the back of a, a 3-0 win. Couldn't have had it better really to make the introduction so yeah pleasure thanks thanks very much for having me our absolute pleasure george and we're going to start with you to kick off the show now at spurs free norwich nil that's two wins five goals scored none conceded i've got to say a very satisfying few days for spurs and you know up to fifth and we'll go fourth and this is the big obviously big here if we do win our game in hand against Burnley, what can obviously go wrong at all? Um, but of course, the likes of Mora, Sonny, Skip, outstanding. George, you've been in that stadium. You've come back recently. Um, tell us your thoughts on that win against Norwich City today at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. As you said, very, very impressive all in all. I think we we knew what opportunity it was given results and people playing each other, the United and Arsenal's, etc. recently and how we always expect Tottenham to, to fall at the hurdle of opportunity. Um, but it didn't turn out to be as, as with Brentford. Um, we played mostly very, very well. I thought the first half, we perhaps gave too much possession to them in stages, etc. It took a little bit of time for us to get into the game. They had a chance with Pookie early on, um, which could have gone either way, but we, we dealt with that well. And, uh, I thought creatively, certainly the front feet today were really starting to get on it. We saw the start of that at Brentford, um, of which we sort of not been scoring many goals. And I said to said to my dad at the game, I, said, I can't even remember the last time we scored three, let alone look quite comfortable in scoring three. Um, so we really, there really is a buzz about the ground now. Um, it wasn't a pleasant experience during during the Nuno brief era, uh, but we're really starting to get our foothold now into sort of the Conte way of playing and, and you can really see the players taking taking heed of that. Oh man, and George, just for clarification, um, do you do a Hugo Lloris impression on the side there from Kurt Butler? <laughs> only, on, only on Saturday nights. <laughs> you heard of me first. Like I say, delighted to have George on the show. Really looking forward to his opinions throughout. And like I say, I agree with what he said there. Now, um, bringing it back to obviously one of our returning guests, a regular, that's on the last one on Spurs. Talia, coming around to you. Um, a good win for Spurs. We're now unbeaten in four league games. And uh, Antonio Conte winning the last three, considering just the one. Brilliant goal by Mora. And for Spurs now, just two points off the top four with a game in hand. I mean, Talia, what a difference a month makes. I think it does, you know, I think as we all kind of have spoken about before, and I know since I've been on um, as well, we were all so kind of fed up with the football that we were playing under Jose and Nuno and how unexcited the players were, etc. And we all kind of had the same opinion that, you know, when Conte comes, if they can't get hyped up for Conte, then what the hell are they doing as professional footballers, right? Um, 
you know, the atmosphere's obviously got better in the stadium from the fans. And I think we've kind of seen that reciprocated from the players for the most part. And I think the biggest thing to speak about, or again, off the back of what we said last time, is more the identity and the style of play that is becoming more and more evident with every game. Um, and I know, like Conte said before as well, you know, he he's not a magician and he can't do complete wonders. But we've already seen, you know, players like Davies, I'd even say Dyer, Skippy looks phenom. Like players are, you know, showing up and doing things that they haven't previously been doing. And I think it's been really clear, like with the use of the wing backs, like what's going on. And we all can kind of see that's the vision. That's what we want. And it's positive. And, you know, we'd be silly not to. And I think, you know, of course, it's encouraging to have the same team getting the wins, only conceding one is great. I think someone tweeted me today being like, do you think it's just because we've got, you know, lower league opposition or are we actually getting better? And I said, I generally do think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, we, we wouldn't get these results. And I, I still think, sorry to be negative, like we're not going to beat Liverpool. You know, we don't have the skills well, yet. Don't say never. You never know. You never know. You never know. But I don't see us putting in an unbelievable performance potentially against a team like them at this current point. But we should be beating who we have been beaten. And I think, like I said, defensively has been real improvements. Offensively has been improvements. But I think we can obviously still get better. But it was a good game. Enjoyed it. And yeah, we're on the right trajectory. So let's keep going. We are indeed. Like I say, it's, it's bizarre to I think the last couple of shows we've had you on the positivity. Um, no. it, you, know, you, used to, you used to give him a bollocking. Now it's almost like we're going to keep praising him now. It's the most complete opposite effect. Um, Someone said um, today, make sure you swear. And please get angry. Even if you, <laughs> that doesn't happen. And I was like, I mean, I can promise the swearing, but I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm not. I mean, there's, there's normally a routine Ben Davis rant in there, but now it's the most opposite now to Ben. And like I say, well, you I, know I who's gonna... asked me about to get me on I my rant. Know. There's two I people. Know. I know them. I've name checked the word. Don't worry. We're going to come on to Ben Abile, and I promise you there's a lot of praise coming on. Oh. Em, let's come around to you. And that's three clean sheets in, well, the last four Premier League fixtures now for Antonio Conte's men. Just the one goal conceded. I mean, even the back three is working so well. I mean, has it surprised you just how quickly the players have almost already, like I say, transitioned to yet another new philosophy, yet another new manager in Antonio Conte? And why do you personally think it's working so well at the moment? Uh, I, if I'm honest, I, I, I am a bit surprised how quick it sort of happened. But I suppose, as everyone says, that's the Conte effect. And I think, you know, the improvement that's already been seen in a month, like just think about what could happen in the next few months. Um, and I think, you know, play, obviously players are still adapting to the formation, but I think there's definitely improvements, as Talia said, defensively, or still things to work on offensively. But I think overall, you know, I've seen interviews with Dyer, Davis, Son, all saying, you know, obviously the intensity, especially in training, has gone up a lot from Nuno, but they're all really enjoying it. They're all looking forward to going to training. And I think it's so important for the players to buy into the manager and want to actually play for the manager. And I think from the from the majority of them, it does look like they're really enjoying, you know, the first few weeks under Conte. And I just think, I think as well, sort of the, the downfall that we sort of saw under Nuno and, the, and everything you know, George and Tally have both just mentioned to then sort of get Conte in, which a lot of people, for a lot of people, it was unexpected. I think it's it's just, you've got to, we've had to go into it straight away and just up the game. And I think, yeah, only more improvements to come, hopefully. I totally agree. No, I just think at the moment, there, there's such a real positivity around the club. And I think we touched on this earlier, you know, when we said, I mean, Steve McDoo says there, you know, amazing what ketchup can do. I think it's a bit more than ketchup. And I, I, I know we laugh and joke about that, but there is a real togetherness now. And obviously you guys all been in that stadium as well. You feel it, right? There's, you know, Absolutely. We, we knew under Nuno coming to you, George, that, you know, it wasn't anyone's real desirable appointment. Let's be honest about it. I don't think any Spurs fan was sold on it. Because naturally, you want to get behind the manager. Because if you're going to go, you know, like you do home and away, you have to feel some investment there to want to back the team, back the manager. But when you know something isn't working, it's very difficult to keep being positive. But with Conte, you know that the man is a born winner. You know, wherever he's been, he's won trophies. He's done it convincingly. So in a way, George, has it surprised you in terms of the start we've had under Conte? And do you think it does massively help the fact that as supporters, we are all so much bought into this, even to the points that we're all singing his name. And I say he's even saying, you know, oh, calm down. You know, I'm not used to it. <laughs> he's saying, wait until I've deserved it. But this is what it is for Spurs. We're so excited about this manager, aren't we? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I also think it's the players similarly buying into it as well. Uh, they, the dire interview that came out on Sky Sports today, talk about how they want to be pushed. They want to be, they want to be basically pushed to their limits. And, and the extra training sessions that similar to Poch that Conte's brought in is a motivator. Players know that if they're at the peak of their performance and and the data shows they're running the stats, etc., it's well renowned how how sort of sluggish we were under Nuno and Jose in the way and how our fitness really tailed off. Um, and Conte not only obviously has come in and there's the cliche new manager bounce, et cetera, more, more aside the result of that. Um, you can really see the difference. And I think obviously the fitness plays a big part in that. The fans really get on board with Tottenham have always got on board with players that put in the extra yard of effort. We love a trier. Um, Skippy just used to be a great trier. Now he's a great all-rounder um, and getting better and better. And he really encapsulates, I think, pretty much everything that Conte is trying to do at the Tottenham at, Tottenham at the moment. And uh, like you say, going... Following the club home and away and having done so sort of the last five, six years and the difference sort of under Mourinho where we were going and sort of the buzz and almost going, not as a chore because that sounds sort of selfish, but really struggling to get get behind the boys, um, knowing the performances that we were putting in. But now it's it's really like we've turned a corner. Um, and, and as you say, Conte's got such a CV behind him that you can't. You can't help but give a little crack, a little smile, even this early on. Um, Talia touched on, obviously, the Liverpool game that's coming up in a couple of weeks, which will be the first proper test yeah, since Conte's totally got his feet under the table. Um, and mm-hmm. it'll be really interesting to see how we do uh, yeah. in that one. Hopefully, injuries aside, we keep ourselves quite fit. Um, but yeah, really, really exciting. And I think just touching on just touching on Skip today, and I know we'll go into him in a little bit more detail, uh, no doubt, alongside Davis, but... He was man of the match clear again, I think, in my opinion, in the middle of the park. He, he gave Norwich nothing. I don't know if that was extra motivation of having played for them last season. Um, but really impressed also with how he's looking forward with the ball now. Um, he used to be breaking up play similar to what Pierre does, but he's really now trying to bridge that gap, that that issue we have between the midfield two and the front three. Obviously, we don't have a number 10. We don't have an Ericsson in there. We don't have a firing Delhi. Tangi's not quite there for, for one reason or another. Um, and I know Conte has really asked Skip to sort of fill that gap as best we can before we invest. And uh, I really felt like today he sort of even manned up even more so than he had been. And I was I was really, really impressed with him today. Totally agree. I promise you there's a section coming that's dedicated to Ollie Skip and Ben Davis. Don't worry, I know there's a lot of people waiting for, the, waiting for the Ben Davis content. Uh, but tell you what I do want to come around and ask you about is obviously that home record now, 100% still under Conte. We know it's early days, but um, that awful goal difference that he inherited is nearly eradicated. And I think you have to you know look at that and think, do you know what? By the token of fact, he's had what, you know, let's be honest about it, you know, just over four weeks, just over four weeks, you know, where there's been a lot of games, not been a lot of time to train. Um, has it surprised you just how quickly the players have got to grips with Conte's philosophy and I say already bought into it? And I say bought into it, it's the, the main core of players. We know there's certain players that want away. I mean, we can name Chip Knights, obviously, maybe a Deli Alley. Uh, you know, again, we've said Damison Sanchez, but I think he actually played quite well today, Damison Sanchez. Uh, Harry Winks, you know, there's certain players that do need to move for whatever reason. But the core group there are buying into Conte, aren't they? That's the most important thing. 100% and like you know I've seen a few comments and what we've said already is that if you're not buying into it why are you at a top six club like you go to a top six club to be managed by one of the best managers in the world and if you can't get on board with that then you're in the wrong profession like you're rarely going to get a better manager than Conte right like there is no excuse to not be on board I think a big part of it is you know we've all said many a times again a lot of our players are deadwood players they have been a part of the squad when we were in a Champions League final, in the Champions League religiously. We were a, you know, a fighting side in a title race, qualifying for top four. You know, we were arguably a lot better then than we are now. Those players are the same. They have that passion and they want to be back there. I think, you know, it's been lost. There was the initial hype with Mourinho that he was the one to get us back. You know, fans, players, whatever, that didn't work out. And that's cool. But, you know, Nuno was the opposite of that. And it was, you know, I can't get hyped up for this guy. He's not where we want to be. And now all of a sudden we've got Antonio Conte, one of the best managers in the world at our club. I want to be better again. I know I can be there. You know, I want to get into my country. I want to be at the World Cup, blah, blah, blah. They all want the best for themselves, let alone the club. Like, they're all incredible professionals at the end of the day, whether they are talented enough to be here or not. You know, so I think he obviously has that 
persona and mentality where he's so vocal, so animated on the touchline going, you know, get in the zone, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's normal, I think, for players to jump on board with that. I think, like I said, it'd be weird if they didn't. Um, but yeah, I guess the pace of that is quicker than maybe some of us expected. But then again, I think that is just because they haven't been on board before. I think this is probably quite a normal reaction and what you'd expect. We are simply kind of half blinded because we haven't seen that in a while. That's um, true. Yep. That that that's my honest kind of opinion. But of course it's an incredible job. And like George just touched on and we'll continue to do so. Like the back four, I guess, is our biggest or five in this case, is our biggest improvement, you know, and that is something that we have been lacking. Yep. We had one of the best defenses in Europe you know, five, six seasons ago and now have arguably one of the worst sometimes. You know, we conceded three goals after three goals after three goals. And, you know, now we've conceded one in however many. Like, that's, of course, it's a remarkable improvement. And that is something that he, you know, has to take responsibility for him and the players. And I think that's great. But, yeah, I think we're just getting started, really. Yeah. And I, you know, I think the thing as well is, Tal, to touch on what you said there, Um, you know, it's fair to say that under Nuno, we never had... The new manager bounce, did we? I mean, we, listen, we had the first three games, and I think even the first three games, people were saying to me, "Yeah, but you know, even when I was trying to get that, get the hype on this show, people said, yeah, but you know, it's new, no, it's not, it's not going to work long term. The sustainability of those wins, it just isn't going to work." And I'll be honest with you, you know, those first three wins meant a lot to me because of how, like, say, the crowd galvanised that Harry Kane situation. Well, it was so I'm sure. toxic, wasn't it? It was the opposite. Yeah. Same when Nuno yeah, yeah. left, went from pure mm. toxicity in the stadium to all yeah. of us booing, being like we don't want you, to so all of a sudden, you know, I think most fans in general will back the manager out. We support Tottenham Hotspur. Yeah, we don't course. support Mourinho or Nuno or Conte. We yeah, support we, first, exactly. so you naturally yeah. have to back your manager. We mm. all thought, you know, this isn't the right fit, especially after all the Levy sentiments, blah, blah, blah. We all knew that, players included, you know. He, he wasn't the one for us. And I think, you mm. know, we all know it turned out even worse than it probably should have. Yeah. Um, I think it's a personality thing as well. I mean, Nuno was, and I don't want to offend anyone here, but he didn't have the persona that Pochettino or even Mourinho to an extent. I mean, Mourinho doesn't hit with everyone, mm. but he does have a lot of fanatical fans about him. Uh, yeah. But Con Conte, on a separate note, he just, he just he brings you along with with his ride, and and you saw him. I don't know if he did it today. I'm not seeing footage, right. but him drumming up the crowd and things like that. Yeah, yeah. He, he really, was like he really, a few times going yeah, like yeah, it makes you feel part of the project. Uh, you really get on board with what he's trying to do, and the difference in the in the ground is, it's it's one to chalk, ten. It's crazy. chalk and cheese, isn't it? I mean, it's it's just chalk and cheese. And I think the most impressive thing coming around to you, I mean, is the way he has improved. So many players, such a short space of time. And I'll be honest with you, you know, um, the likes of Davis, we are going to come on to shortly. You know, certain players where he's almost found them a new position and they're excelling. And, you know, you've got to give the manager credit for that. And let's be honest about it. He's been here for what? I mean, he's been here for just over four weeks. And I think with Nuno, to not go back in the past too much, you know, Nuno was here for three months. Couldn't really see a clear identity, a clear plan of what Spurs are trying to do. But yet, four weeks under Antonio Conte, you can already clearly see the vision and the philosophy of how this man wants to play, wants his Spurs team to play. Oh my God, we're enjoying it, aren't we? I know. I think I think that was one of the main sort of criticisms was this identity. And I think, you know, that's already been seen in this short space of time under Conte. And I think, you know, he's obviously, he's already said a number of times about his ambition and, you know, he wants to take us to the top. And okay, yes, it might take a while. As Tally already touched on, he said he's not a magician, but I think there's, there's already signs of improvement and that can only continue. And I think, as again, George touched on, the, the passion on the touchline, I think is just, it, it is the complete opposite to Nuno. And I just think that in itself, when you see a manager on the touchline, getting, getting the fans going, getting the players going constantly, you know, I saw today, Kane went to the, went to Conte and he was, talking to him during the match and, you know, just giving them all of that during the match and egging on the fans and getting everyone behind the team. I think that can only help the players on the pitch. You know, they can all hear the fans chanting and getting everyone going. And I think just overall, I think from the difference between Nuno and Conte, everyone is behind him and he knows that. And I saw in his press conference today, he was saying, you know, how how good it feels to hear the fans and I just think that can only all help and I think obviously getting these results and improved performances just put that all together and great things to come. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I've got to ask you, listen, you've had the, uh, in the in the job you do, of course, with Football London, connected with Spurs, you've got the, the pleasure, I'd say now, maybe not the pleasure on the Nuno, but obviously of dealing with um, Antonio firsthand. How, how have you found him in press conferences? Because, I mean, the people I speak to that have been around Antonio say there's a real presence and an aura about him where when you're in the room with him, you feel that you're in the room with someone very special. Do you, do you feel that when you're, you know, interviewing him or obviously at press conferences? Yeah, I think 100%. Um, I, yeah, went to his press conference last week and um, I asked him about Sessignon and, you know, he just gives such insightful answers. And also, I think the honesty, you know, even today, um, obviously he praised Mora, but also saying he, he wants him to score more goals. So I just think, yeah, I think he gives, he's very honest, but doesn't fail to praise where praise should be given and also can see where improvements still need to be made. But yeah, I definitely think when you're in a room with him, you know you're in the room with him. Yeah, I think the challenge you guys have got, and uh, I think Ali Gold was saying the other week, is trying to get him to give you an answer that's uh, no longer than three minutes, right? Is that, is that the key at the moment? <laughs> you can't yeah. six or seven questions and only get yeah. one in. I know, exactly, yeah. And it's just, I mean, it's great because you get great answers from him, but it's like you want to know more and you want to ask about everyone and you just got to pick very carefully. Two questions and you're finished, that's it. <laughs> 50, people, 50 people turn up to the press conference and then you get two and ask the questions, you can't make it up. Um, you know, Tal, just coming around to you, because you are very honest, that's why we love having you on here. Um, you know, people will say it was only Brentford and Norwich the last two games in the Premier League. But I mean, again, you take into account, it's five goals scored, it's back-to-back clean sheets at Spurs. You know, we've struggled for so long keeping that back door shut. I mean, does that speak volumes of the progress being made under content. I and mean, when you add into the likes of the form of Dyer, who I think, again, will come on to, has done very, very well, Davis, Skip in particular. I mean, is that a good measure of just Antonio Conte's coaching ability to get so much out of those players already in such little amount of time because there's been so many games and not much time to focus on the training ground? No, 100%. I think, you know, you do have to take into account your opposition. You know, it would be disrespectful not to do that, you know, to some degree. But I think that no game is easy in the Premier League. There are games that you should be winning as Tottenham and as other teams. And there are games that, you know, are potentially more challenging. And on paper, these games are more winnable games. And, you know, we should be winning them regardless of who our manager is and where we are and how we're playing. They should be very winnable games where we make up that goal difference. You know, that is something that I think we all expect as fans, irrespective of the current situation. So I think we do have to remember that, of course, yeah, we're playing Norwich, we're playing Brentford, they're promoted teams, we should be winning, especially at home, like that should be a thing. But at the same time, again, we have conceded a lot of goals to a lot of teams. And, you know, I don't want to take credit away from them either. You know, Brentford have put in some great performances this season. They're a hard team to beat. You know, big teams have struggle to beat them or drawn with them you know and that there's a lot so for us to beat them is amazing Norwich too I think especially under Dean Smith so far they played some good football today you know they're not incredible finishers but they played some good football and you know potentially the old Tottenham would have 100% conceded to both of them especially in that first half yeah, I mean, I, I think Norwich at one point, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, I think tell they had 64% of possession at one point. They were dominating. Yeah, yeah. Let's be honest about really it. They were, we yeah. were watching, you know, and me, everyone else included, we're getting well laggy because it's like, mm. we're at home, they're a newly promoted side. They are dominating the ball. That isn't really okay, especially with what we've been seeing and what we've been expecting. Like, we do expect more from that. Um, but I think all round, to answer your question, it's like, I do expect to be winning, but I do think the old Tottenham are potentially not under Conte would have struggled a lot more like you know we didn't potentially play the best football we've ever seen today even on Thursday but we were encouraging we looked dangerous at points you know we are a lot more exciting to watch we see the wing backs we see what the vision is and even defensively you kind of don't ever think at the moment oh my god like Hugo today I have to say (laughs) did do a few things where I was a bit like what yeah yeah there was one second half where i had my heart in my mouth a little bit literally i was just like oh my god that distribution was shocking like i mean i think it's can't take a beer for 10 years we're still gonna feel that way aren't we about some of these players you know what the first thing i did after i saw that i watched him and he was literally going mental yeah and i'm like um conte you've got that for years mate (laughs) that's never going away it's a great, there's, a, there's, there's some great images already. Just out of, uh, sometimes when they're like that, that pause, it looks like he's already aged about 10 years at some times. I, mean, yeah. well, I, say, well, I said to him, I, I said that hair transplant, he's going to get another one by the time he's finished here. Trust me. Um, <laughs> it's so funny. But honestly, no, no, you know, 
know, it, it's yeah. good. I think we're playing well. I don't want to take it away from Conte mm. or the team. I think we do just have to, again, be semi respectful and realistic that that yeah. is the opposition that we should be looking to. Yeah, let's come around at you, George. Um, ahead of the game, Spurs and Conte just made the one change to his Norwich uh, to face Norwich. I mean, the matches at the moment, we know they're piling up for Conte as he faces a match every three to four days now. So we've got a really busy month ahead of us. We knew the Argentines, Christian Romero, Juan Lo Celso still remain out for the moment. Are the former until early 2022. Um, with the latter expected to be back in full training on Monday. That's the Celso, of course. Uh, Emerson Royale. Brian Hill miss out due to illness. There has been speculation it may be something a bit more serious. But again, um, until we have any news on that, we can't really speculate. Uh, Javit Tanganga, of course, came back into the team as a right wing back. While elsewhere, the team was the same one that beat Brentford. Uh, Joe Roden was back on the bench, as was Dane Scarlett, who returned from injuries. So that team led, that team read Lloris, Sanchez, Dyer, Davis, Tanganga, Skip, Hoybier, Regulon, Lucas, Kane, Son. Team on paper, George, are you roughly happy with that? And are you surprised so far that under Conte, um, he has tried to keep, I'd say, quite a settled side for the Premier League games, at least? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I completely agree. And it's been well-renowned and well-spoken about that he's, he's picked the the safe the safe core, I think, probably uh, in the majority of his games so far. We saw what happened away at Mora when he, when he sort of went away from the template a little bit. Um, and it just almost showed him or confirmed to him that certain members of this squad can't be trusted at the moment. Um, and that's to put it quite bluntly, unfortunately. But uh, Jose fine. had the same, Luna had the same. Um, and it's it's an issue that we've had going back years. Uh, and it's a weird one. I spoke to Ali Ali Gold actually about this briefly on, on Twitter the other day and how he can't put his finger on quite why those that are on the fringes of this first 11 seem to find it difficult to take the opportunity when, when presented to it in bulk. Um, I say in bulk because players like Joe Rodden, I think, have been given a bit of a rough ride. He's he's never really put a foot wrong. Um, he came on against Palace away this year, but that was that was a game that had been thrown before he arrived on onto the pitch. Um, going back to the team that he's picking, I think it almost picks itself at the moment. Having said that, before the game, Lucas for Bergwijn or something like that, you could have seen perhaps happening. Um, I was worried a little bit about Reggie picking up an injury anyway. He hasn't. He hasn't really had a rest, to be honest, with Davis moving into left centre back. There's no real cover after Sessignon, uh, before Sessignon came back to fitness. So he's played a lot of games. Hopefully, his he says he says it's not he's not major injury, but hopefully it's not. Um, equally, you can't really change a winning or well, winning, but you can't really change a settled side if it's doing you no. well. Um, no, exactly, yeah. And you go on Twitter and you look at the replies to the lineup, and there aren't many people throwing their toys out the pram. Um, <laughs> not it's yet. Not like, it's early days, though, George. <laughs> yeah, we'll give it some time. I've no doubt it will come. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. I, it, yeah. I think, um, yeah, at the moment, Conte knows who he can trust. He knows who are performing. I'm, I was delighted to see Lucas actually bring something to to the pitch, apart from a couple of amazing runs today. Um, mm. And his finish was sublime. I was right behind it in, in the park lane and uh, to see it nestled in the top corner was great for him because it often happens where he'll, he'll do a couple of runs here and there and it will, it will often come down a block corridor. Um, it's the most frustrating thing because he's the only one that can run with the ball in, in tight areas like he does and knock on one and twos around with Son, etc. Um, and to see that come off for him finally uh, was great. And as Conte said, hopefully it happens again. But um, I can see him changing for Thursday. I think we'll see a couple of changes in, in, in perhaps the back line uh, with, with Joe coming in and, and Galini probably in goal. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just we'll see again for Brighton away uh, the following weekend. Yeah, and let's come back around to you. I just want to ask your thoughts in terms of some of the players that aren't featuring at the moment, the likes of Joe Roden, who I think has been speculated over the last week or so. I think from your colleague Ali Gold that maybe he'll be open now to a move in January. And the likes of Deli Ali can't find his way in. Is it just a case now where Conte has got you know a core of players there that he can ultimately trust, and it's a willing. You know, even Tongi and Dumbele, of course, you know, uh, club record signing, can't even get looking at the moment. You feel under Nuno Mourinho, that'd be headlines. But because Conte's in charge and we are getting results, it's not really getting much publicity at the moment. Are you surprised any of those players I've mentioned there aren't getting a chance at the moment? Yeah, I think, obviously, we've touched on Joe Roden. I think Conte said the other day he sort of, he sees him in the middle of that back three, which is obviously coming in for Dyer and you know whilst Dyer is playing well I think he's going to find it hard to get a look in but I do think he's been unlucky because I think as George said you know when he has been given the chance although that's not been many he, he hasn't really done much wrong I think the likes of Ali I think there's a lot of speculation because you don't know it we, we obviously don't see 
what happens behind closed doors and you know is it that they're not working hard enough in training is it something else you know and I think Conte obviously has the players he trusts I think it's good to keep consistency in the lineup where you can so those players get used to playing alongside each other and I think you know it's it's like the NS Muir game last week you know if if players aren't sort of aren't up for it and when they're giving the chance aren't proving that why they should why they deserve a place in the lineup then I kind of think he's every right to leave them out I mean so I I think you, they've got to step up in training if they haven't already, if they want to be given a chance. Um, and I think it's sort of just time will tell. Obviously, you know, there's only a month away till the January transfer window. And obviously, we don't know how much business will be done in that. And obviously, it's a harder window to do business in. But if the likes of those fringe players that you mentioned don't step up, I do think a couple of them could sort of be on their way. I also no, think, can I just add something there? I also think there must be a really good reason why between three to four managers, they're still fringe players, yeah, right? Definitely. And, yeah, and yeah, I think exactly. that is something to remember as well, because a lot of these players, they come on, I think one of you said it before, they never take their opportunities. We've now gone through three to four managers that mm. most of them have been around for. Everyone comes in with a fresh start where let's try, see what it is. None of them yeah. make the first team. Or if they do, it lasts one or two weeks and they're straight back into the fringe. And that, you know, speaks volumes, really. Uh, I'm interested, Tal, because um, this is probably your one, because we're going to go, this is quite a positive show. There's not much chance to bollock some of these players, but uh, this is probably one of your only chances at the moment because these players are not in the team. Um, the likes of Ndombele, the likes of Deli Ali, Joe Roden. I mean, not saying that Joe Roden's done anything wrong here, but is there a case for you that you'd be trying to move these players on to have a group at that club that are very competitive, know they're going to play? Because I almost feel... When you have got players around like Ndombele, Deli Ali, that know they're not first choice and not in the manager's plans, they're not going to give you absolutely everything on that pitch when you are playing Europa Conference League, uh, League Cup, FA Cup games. Because Conte, like you said, he is going to switch it up. You know, it's a, you know, we've got crazy schedule coming in December, crazy between December and January. You've got to have players you can trust, haven't you? 100%. I think, you know, something, again, Conte isn't going to take any prisoners, right? He, he's not that kind of guy. Nuno, again, don't want to, you know, down talk him too much, but he's the kind of person that, especially small egos, he's not really the one to be like, oh, you know, behave yourself kind of thing. Like, that's not who no. he is. Conte will have absolutely none of that. He wants an 11 plus subs that he can rotate and, you know, trust them to come in when they're needed. Like today, you know, you don't expect Reggie to be injured after 20 odd minutes. You know, he needs someone to come on. He doesn't need to think, oh, this is a headache. You just want someone that's ready, that's been training well, that can come in. I think it's it's all about mentality. You know, players like Tangi, we've said it before, he, he's not got the mentality, irrespective of talent. He's obviously talented, but he's not got a future yeah. because he doesn't want to be there. He's not that kind of player. Again, a couple of managers have said now they've got issues with him. Get rid of it, you know. It, it's a shame, but he's not for us. So well, I must say very quickly because I say we are we are going to come on to a break in a second for our listeners and audio. But before we do, I mean, I don't know if you saw Tao at one point today uh, and Dombele warming up. I mean, Lockie was warming down to be honest with you. I mean, there wasn't, you know, it was just the most they bizarre. Don't, they didn't don't need to warm up. He was wrapped in blankets all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I, I think it is difficult, you know, if, if you especially like players like Delhi, like you know, you were a top top player playing for your country scoring goals, you know, being one of the best players in England, all spoken about, to literally not even being a third choice half the time as a sub. Like, that is difficult to get. But also, again, there's reasons for this stuff, you know. And we are, as a fan base, I think we're so nice generally. And we, you know, want players and it's all sentimental. And it's like, oh, but... Very tolerant. That, exactly that. And I think a lot of yeah. this now, you know, Poch spoke about the rebuild. Half of them are still here. It now is time. Get rid of the winxes, please get rid of Doherty. Like, just get rid of some of these players. They're not going to play for Spurs. Replace them, please. There you go. You heard that heartfelt uh, thoughts there, Italian. Tab, before we do go for a quick break, uh, thoughts on the Deli Ali TikTok video? Got any thoughts on that? Deli Ali's an idiot. I just <laughs> think he's just an idiot. I don't care. Right? It's incredible, isn't it? Because you think with Delhi, I mean, he's got another chance under another new manager who actually really likes him. You know, I've got to say, Conte's comments on Delhi. Um, you know, he, he said himself, you know, he's a manager that, you know, seen him score against Chelsea on numerous occasions. George, come on to you about Delhi. Are you surprised that? 
He's not that no, big. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think Conte's seeing great. that? In, do you think Conte's seeing that in training, or is he just disinterested? It, it almost feels like with Deddy that he's he's almost lost the love of playing football now, George. But that's yeah. it. He just, he's an Instagrammer. Not, he's an yeah. Instagrammer. He needs to put that time on the training yeah. pitch, and then mm. it's such difficult to argue for him any other such, way now. Such a uh, shame because he, he had a, a brief renaissance, didn't he? Under under Jose, I think mm. it was sort of around, around when we played Norwich. I think in in the league last time they were showing the highlights before the game. Yeah. Um, he just doesn't. He doesn't look like he cares enough. <laughs> yeah, it's it a real like shame. He cares enough. Yeah, no, it it's is. a real shame. Um, yeah, no, mm. I think like I say the conscious of that say there's a uh, many great performances to talk about, and that is where we're going to turn next. So for our listeners on audio, we're going to go for our first break of the show. Uh, during this break, you're going to hear from Lucas Mora and from Antonio Conte who give their thoughts on the back of Spurs' win against Norwich. For our watching audience on YouTube, nearly over 500 of you watching us live, thank you so much as always for your incredible support. And we've got to say this week, had some amazing reviews coming from Spotify. I know there's a Spotify wrapped um, at that moment tells you how many people are listening to the show. And um, there's been, I say, crazy amounts of listening coverage. I think we've had about 40,000 hours of last one on Spurs being listened to by some people. If that is the case, I've got, I recommend you go and get your head checked because 40,000 hours of this could actually finish you. So um, thank you so much for the support. Uh, but as, as always, love it. Keep them coming. Uh, Lee McQueen, you'll notice, isn't here at the moment. So wishing Lee and his missus a very happy anniversary. We gave Lee the night off. Typical, the, the one like Lee has off and Spurs have their uh, record win of the season, but it is only against Norwich. We hope there's many more of them to come. So it's time, guys, to get into the story of the game. M, we're going to start with you because it was a lovely goal to start the, the, the way for Spurs of this game. Uh, Lucas Mora playing a 1-2 with Hun Min Sommer for unleashing a terrific strike from outside the box, which flew into the top corner. Lucas actually, after the game, said that's in amongst his top three goals for Spurs. I tell you what, if Lucas was doing that every single week, I don't think you'd be at Tottenham, but I mean, in Germany, we wouldn't be uh, so diverse on him, would we? What a strike. Yeah, I think it was just, I think everyone was a bit shocked, but it, it was a great goal. And I'm very, I'm very happy that he got the goal. And, you know, I think with Lucas, sometimes there's this sort of, you know, we all, we all remember the Ajax game. And I think that is sometimes what everyone goes back to. And I think he's, he's already, you know, he, he does great stuff in the game, but it is sort of sometimes that end product, that final pass that he lacks. So I think him getting a goal today, I think he had some great link ups with Sun, one twos, like he did with the goal. Um, and I think, I think as well, just, just generally, it was uh, like we've been seeing in the last two games, the goals have been more of showing more of a team performance and more of playing, playing forward in to get the goals, which obviously I know is something that Conte likes. And I think, yeah, just especially for more, I think he took it so well. It was great that it went in, and I think overall he had a he I think he had an, a, a much improved performance just with him getting forward, getting those runs as he always does, but actually finding finding the man having a, an improved final product and final pass. Totally agree. No, it was I say. I mean, the goal itself was quite was quite sumptuous, wasn't it? I mean, let's come around to you, Tal, because um, you know, great piece of skill, lovely one-two there with Son, and then a shot really thundered into the top bins. And, you know, I think for, for Lucas, that is a really, really special goal. And as I've said before, there's already feels under under Conte. There is an improvement in Lucas. I've got to say, you know, he's not got his head down as much. You know, we were criticising him. I've said this analogy before. Do you know what Lucas reminds me of? Uh, if you ever watched Gladiators, I know this is quite a while ago, that is when they run through the gauntlet. That, that was Lucas. You know, wouldn't look up, go straight through the gauntlet, no look up at all where they were going. But, you know, even under Conte in the very early days, I think he's going to improve him. I, I really, really do. And again, you know, with Mora, of course, many people say there's, there's some out there believe, obviously, he's living off Ajax. But um, there's one thing that he does bring, and that is passion. And you know what? And you've got to say that, and even his interview today after the game they gave to Spurs TV, um, he does absolutely give everything, doesn't he? He leaves it all out on the pitch. And there's one thing that you can't criticise him for, and that's the effort. Correct. You know, I, and I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about tip skill and talent, blah, blah, blah. But passion is something that you can't buy. You know, there's players that earn the most money in the world, but it's their job. They don't care. You know, he cares so much. And it is so nice to see that of a player, you know, whether it's coys, 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 whether people laugh at him or not. Like, he is so coys. And it's great. I think, you know, we all treat Lucas as kind of, the super sub or the player that can kind of do something but can't do everything. He's not an all-rounder and he never kind of has been. Um, do you remember, I think maybe before the season, there was that open training session where fans could go to 
I went to that and me and like all my fam, we were like, the player that stood out the most during that session was Lucas. He yep. was scoring goals like he scored today. And all of us were like, why doesn't he do that? You know, we all watch him. He runs through players. He's so good with his feet sometimes. You know, he's yeah, got yeah. a brain on him. He knows Quite what trickery, he's doing. Yeah. Good for but he <laughs> cannot finish the ball or he's got not enough awareness to pass it where he needs to pass it. And in those sessions, he was scoring left, right and centre, some incredible finishes. And we were like, if you do that in training, like how does that not get to the pitch at some point? And genuinely, the last couple of games, we have kind of almost started to see that version of Lucas, which I think is amazing and I sincerely hope that you know with Conte's pressure I think Lucas is someone that will do every single thing he's told to do because he wants to be the best that he can be um and I you know I hope that that rubs off on him he works he hears those comments today and thinks like I'm right I'm better than like this like I can score more I can try more and it's nice you know I'm a full advocate for it anyone that tries their best you know you have to respect and I think you know, he's a decent player. He does get into the team, you know, regularly. And there are some points I know people have said, how does he constantly get in? Like, he's not giving mm. enough. But, you know, I, I think today he was great. At least at half time, he was the man of the match yeah. for me. Like, he was, you know, proper putting a shift in and you can see that. So, yeah, I think Conte's definitely had an effect on Lucas, which I hope continues to flourish. It's just that <laughs> consistency for him now, I think. That's I mean, it. I think that yeah. is it. Yeah, but look at the Ajax semi final yeah. where he banged yeah. those three goals, and everyone's even, like, This is it now. And, and George, even, I mean, really even if we go before that, the United brace, you know, if we go back to that yeah. Man United brace at Old Trafford, and I think at that yeah. time when that brace happened at Old Trafford, we were like, Oh my god, what a player we've got here! Yeah, and you know, that's the thing with Lucas that it's, I mean, it's definitely in his locker, and maybe it is a case of just finding that consistency in amongst a formation that's going to work for a position. But, um, does it surprise you, George? And I say to you, that's, that's his first Premier League goal since February. Yeah, and that's this is what I mean. This is what I mean. But like Talia said, he's always playing, or he's certainly in the first eleven in and around if he gets dropped on the odd game. And you, you're almost wait. It's like a it's like a fizzy bottle of coke where you've just kept the lid on, and you're waiting for the lid to pop off just for from actually to score and keep scoring and keep scoring. Like Conte said today, it's just consistency with him now. We know he's got the ability, and he's the only player going back to that United game at Old Trafford. I was I was at the game, and I was. We've never had a player like that, really. Even going back to the Ginola, where he used to weave past a few players and put it in the bottom corner. Back back then, it was like, whoa, who's this, who's this guy? Uh, and then he'll do it again sort of three, four months later, and then the Ajax game happened. Um, and it really is down to him now. But I do feel like with Conte on board, similar to, I, I put him to like in the Willian category or the Pedro, where Conte had him at Chelsea. Yep. Uh, and they were sort of average to good players um, and he really improved them onto sort of good attacking wingers, inverted wingers who were really well with Diego Costa back then um, and had their own ability to work off each other. Uh, I really think Lucas is in that category with Son as well. Uh, and you'll notice in, during the game, they're swapping to and fro, left wing, right wing, um, Kane dropping off, whether you like him doing that or not. Um, but it really is exciting, I think, to see him grow now as a player uh, and putting him in the same category as Skip and really consistently returning attacking-wise uh, with that creativity is, is great to see for him. Yeah. After the game, to come to you, um, uh, Conte said on Lucas Moura, he's got a fantastic goal, but he has a quality to score more goals and he has to score more goals. It's my expectation to see more goals like this from him. So big words there from Conte about what the future is for Lucas Mora. Do you personally feel, Emma, that we're going to see anything more from Lucas under Antonio Conte? Or do you think we've already seen his peak in a Spurs shirt for you? Um, no, I definitely think that I think there'll still be improvements. And I think, you know, with at the moment, the I'm sure we'll come on to it, the lack of goals from Kane. I think, you know, him and Son do seem to be the ones getting on the end of balls and and getting balls, they're creating things as well as finishing them off. And I think I think there's still improvement to come. And I think hopefully, you know, the goal today has given him a lot of confidence. And I think, as George said, it is about consistency, which I think it is for a lot of the players. But I think if he can continue working and training, Conte's obviously having a good effect on him. I do think I saw a comment um, about the defensive side and getting back. I yep. do... You that know, was not... from uh, Gareth there on the screen. He says, uh, yeah. "Yeah, Lucas left Jaffe exposed on the right time and time again." Is that something you would you would have picked up on as well, Emma? There, I, I did notice it a couple of times. You know, I don't want to be negative, but I, I I did notice it a couple of times. But again, I think it that's about you know as as his fitness 
improves even more. You know, we've already seen seen it clearly under Conte. But I think as his improve as his fitness improves, just tracking back a bit more. But I do think there's I personally think this could sort of not be the start, but I think if he continues to create and him and Son continue those link ups, I definitely think there's more goals to come from him. And as as Conte said, you know, hopefully there is. Yeah. Totally agree. Like I say, um, the confidence at the moment, I mean, even say Lucas Mori, you can feel it in that interview you gave to Spurs TV, which you just heard there for Edison and Audio just before the break. Um, there's some real, real desire there to work under this manager. Now, um, Reguilon had a problem, that, as we saw during that game, the Session came on. It was a blow for Spurs. And for Reguilon, who was just finding his feet as a wing back, um, what we understand after the, after the game is that it shouldn't be too much of a bad injury. We saw him, uh, I think, tweet on Instagram, you know, don't worry, um, don't tell me about your fantasy team just yet. So um, I think on that basis, uh, we can safely say Riggy will be fit for the games ahead. Thursday maybe is a, an interesting one because we know Sessegnon is suspended. So with that being the case, I mean, Reginald may have to play. He lasted just the 22 minutes. He picked up a yellow card before that. And again, we'll see what Thursday comes. Conte said, I was a bit disappointed for Sergio with the injury. But I spoke with him and we don't think it's a bad injury. Uh, Ryan Sessegnon, he got his chance 22 minutes in and um, replacing the injured Reginald. He was a threat getting down that left and driving some low crosses into the box, asking questions at Norwich defence. And he did work both ends. It was, again, a, a bright showing from him. Tell, just on Sessegnon for you, bear in mind how disappointed he must have felt about getting sent off when Antonio gave him that chance, of course, against Ennis Mora. We've tried to forget that game, of course. Um, but Sessegnon in general for you, do you think this is a massive opportunity for him under Conte to play a position where it seems to be his favoured one? Under a manager, let's be honest about it, he does improve so many players in that wing-back position. He's taken Ashley Young there, uh, Victor Moses, and actually improved them in a position which wasn't their own. With Sessi Young, we've always questioned what is his best, best position. Can Conte do that like he's done with those players? I mean, his track record says yes. <laughs> I think, you know, he seems like a player that, again, is so happy and open to learning. You know, he's young. He should be a sponge. He should be so... You know, not to like, you know, rip, I don't even know what the word is, you know, but he should really kind of, you know, take every opportunity that comes his way. He's obviously seen what he can do before. Sess has obviously got the talent. We know that. Conte knows that. You know, his comments prior to that game a few weeks ago was so, you know, optimistic and positive about him saying, you know, he's young. He's only 21. He's got the skills. We just want him to, you know, grow and develop. And I think, you know, he's obviously been super unfortunate with all of the injuries, um, which isn't great. And again, with what happened the other week is really quite, you know, sad, really, because there was a lot of pressure on his shoulders and it obviously just did not go to plan at all. But yeah. again, at the same time, he probably didn't expect to play today. And if he was going to play, it was a very small cameo. And he kind of ended up having to play the bulk of the game. And again, I don't think that was probably expected. I, I, Of course, you have to be ready and prepared to do that. But for a young player, you know, your mentality is kind of, oh, I'm going to pick up everything. I'm going to learn from Reggie. I'm going to watch, etc. I think, you know, he did a great job. I think there was things that he didn't do particularly well. Like he slid down into a challenge, which, you know, is a little bit careless sometimes. You don't necessarily have to do that. And again, he is young. So you kind of do expect that. Um, but I, I think he played well for the most part. I think if he was our first choice, it wouldn't be good enough. But mm. I think he put in a good shift. And like we said, I, I think he should be able to learn from Conte. Excuse yeah. me, I'm extremely happy. I'm always yeah, happy. Yeah, Jay on the screen now. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I can't wait. Sorry. If Spurs do win a trophy and we bring Tanya on, what that is going to be like, that reaction, it's going to be just incredible. We can't wait. Oh, we we're, in, like, listen, we're, we're, we're in four competitions and we've got Ben, we've got, the, listen, for people worried about where Tanya's going to lose her temper, we have got the, uh, we've got obviously the Doherty chat to come. But uh, so much positivity to go through. Don't worry about that yet. No, Do you come? Good. There you are. You good. are. George, let's come back. Let's come back around to you, George. Um, Conte said after the game on Sessi Young, played a good game, and I'm sure that he can do much better. He has the qualities of a player that has great power and he's strong physically. He needs to take confidence with the atmosphere in the stadium. I mean, it does feel, George, he's going to clearly give Sessi Young a chance. And, you know, we spent a lot of money on this guy. I think 30 million at the time. He yeah. came in as part of that transfer window where, um, I know Jason's watching this. He'll never let me forget this, of course. Uh, the window in which we signed, of course, at Le I think Le Celso and, well, I think Ndombele, of course, in that window and Le Celso. And he described it, Jason, as the most horrendous transfer window as a Spurs fan. Hard to disagree. But do you generally think, George, with Sessegnon under Conte, he will come good? 
Yeah, I think so. I, they'll write history books about that transfer window. I think um, it's, it's not going down in the right way. But uh, going back to Ryan, I, th- I thought he did well. I think the, the, the cameo, which unfortunately turned into a cameo against um, NS Mura, was, I think it was just over eagerness. He'd been out for so long. Conte had his press conference that week where he really bigged big him up and he was looking to take confidence from that game. Um, and it, did, it didn't go to plan for whatever reason, but there is a, a reliance on him, I think, now as, as sort of the backup left back or left wing back because of, of Davis moving inside. And you, all you have to do is look across London to Victor Moses, who wasn't a wing back, uh, and see what Conte did to him. Uh, and you look at Setignon, who played there frequently for Fulham, did very, very well in that position, um, albeit very raw. Uh, and today I thought he did well. Max Ahrens isn't slow, but Sessegnon was was on him all the time, one-on-one, arguably more confident perhaps in that situation than, than Regulon. Um, I think having played more forward for Fulham, he's used to sort of taking on players in a 1v1 situation, which is something we haven't really had as a left-back ever since sort of Rose was in his peak uh, peak form, really. So really happy to see him. I think we just have to we have to be patient. He's, the guy's got zero confidence um, at the moment. Yeah, uh, it's just one of those ones. You just got to give him time. He will, will get a bit part opportunity. Regulon's obviously first choice, um, yeah. but I think he'll uh, he'll certainly come good. And he's got a set piece on him if he ever gets that yeah. opportunity. And, and we he's need them, don't got... we, George? I mean, the lack of. <laughs> I mean, I think I say I think it's that crazy stat that we saw today. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think it's uh, you know Spurs have scored from consecutive corners at home. I think for the first time in I think crazy two and a half years. Since 1882, years. I think. Mate. I think it was 1882. <laughs> it, feel, it feels like that anyway. Um, do you know what? I'm, I'm not going to make a pun about this. I could have, I could have said that really bad there, but I'm not going to say that. It feels a long time since Harry Kane's been on a goal guard. Not since 1882, but it's been a while. And, <laughs> and to start with you, I mean, he linked up, played well in the first half, drifted a oh, drifted a chopped effort just wide of Cruz's goal. And again, if that was Kane, I think Kane in peak form, that would be in the back of the net. But again, played well with the ball at his feet, even if he had to little luck in front of goal and another curling effort pushed away by the keeper, but leading to the corner, obviously, that Sanchez scored from. I mean, he is working hard. I mean, I don't think you can question he's working hard. I mean, there's some nice touches, but it just isn't happening from in front of goal. And I can see Tanya's facial expression there. We'll come and ask her in a second. But to you, Emma, at the moment with Kane, what is it going to take to get him scoring again in the Premier League? Honestly, I'd love to know. Um, I just, I, I'm not convinced. I, I, d- I don't know what, you know, I thought sort of with with Conte coming in, I thought that would be sort of the buzz that he needs. Um, and I thought, and then I thought scoring seven in two games for England, I thought, you know, that would give him a bit of momentum. But I just think, you know, as we've, as people have mentioned before, he, he comes back deeper to create stuff, but, you know, it's in front of goal where we know how, how good he can be. And it just really isn't happening for him. And I think, you know, I've sort of said in the past few weeks in some of my articles for Football London that it uh, he's not getting the service that may that and that's potentially a reason he's not scoring. But at the end of the day, he's now getting those chances and still not scoring. So I think it's just I, I'm if yeah if I'm honest, I'm completely not convinced by him. I think he's he he looks tired. He just he just doesn't look interested a lot of the time. And and I think if that can't as as for a lot of the players, if that can't change under Conte, then I hate to say it, but I, I don't know what's what's next for him. It's an interesting view. I mean, Tally, I, I saw your face there, and you know, like I say, someone put it on earlier. You've got a cracking poker face. You know, when, I, when I'm talking, you can clearly see your view on exactly the kind of player I'm talking about. With, with Kane, I mean, you've been you've been very honest on Kane. Like, so you've been on the show numerous times this season about you know um, how he's applied himself, what he should have done, what he shouldn't have done. With Kane right now, what do you think personally? Will we ever see? the Harry Kane that we've known for the last four years, four seasons at this football club where he's been top scorer, quite often he's a golden boot winner. Uh, obviously last season, top assist, top goal scorer as well. Is that Harry Kane still in there for you or has that now just gone in your opinion? I think it goes back to the whole sentimental thing. You know, we as fans have always put Kane as the front man of our club. He's always been on that pedestal. But he's also always lived up to up to that. You know, he's consistently been one of the best strikers in the world, getting the most goals, the most assists. He isn't that player this season. He's not. And I think it, it it's not coming back. And that hurts to say that for all of us. But it's generally true because he's not playing well. And what I think is even more frustrating is Conte saying, I'm happy with how he's playing. How, how can you be happy? Like, that's bullshit, surely, right? You are one of the best managers. You want everyone to be scoring. You've made it very apparent. You want all your players scoring. 
your main striker cannot score a goal. Like that, I'm sorry, I'm not even that great at maths and that equation does not add up to me at all. It's just, it's frustrating because I do think his all-around play is, you know, he's always been a huge player for us at the back and, you know, he does some incredible things. His vision is great. And I think that side of it is still there. You know, he's still a top athlete. He's still a top professional in his training and his, he's working hard and he does bring that element to the team. But he's not scoring goals. He's not in the right places at the right time. He is lethargic. I know he's not a top runner, but even today he's not running where he should be. And if anything, I actually think today... I think he had the most effort I've seen in a while. I mm. said before, the other last couple of games, I think he's been absolutely awful. And I always laugh, like, he's in my fancy team, right? And I said, if he can't score today, I'm getting him out, right? I'm fed up now because he needs to score. And I did think he put in more effort, but he's just not got it. Like you said, he'd have buried those chances. He's got mm. zero confidence. He's not taking them. If he is, he's missing. And he's just laying flat on the floor like, oh, God, what is happening? Like, how are you meant to get that back? Like Emma said, like, we all thought, oh, if that was an England shirt, it'd have bloody buried the thing. How and why can't he score? It's like, it is frustrating. I just don't get it. And of course, there is some elements of lack of creativity in things. But at the same time, that we've never really had a hugely creative team and haven't for a while. He was still putting in the goals. Him and Sonny were telepathic. Sonny's still there. Kane and him do not have that connection this season. Why does why well, why don't they? You know, there is different elements. I think it's a super complex issue. But for me, I am getting fed up, and I it, do. It's interesting. Yeah. I do. It, it's that, interesting how yeah. It, it's do. interesting how you say that because I mean again I mean with Kane here the comments and this is the thing about doing this live where you get um, a real diversity of opinions. Some are firmly behind you, others feel you know he is giving his everything and it's it's down to service. I mean George. Where do you stand on that Harry Kane debate for you? Is it a lack of service? Um, is it a case where, you know, he just simply isn't applying himself correctly? You go home and away every week, George. You watch him up close and personal. What is it for you? Yeah, it's a difficult to touch on it. It's a really complex issue with him. And I think, to be honest, there's a lot behind the scenes that we don't know about from this summer. Um, publicly, whatever came out publicly and whatever happened with, with his agent and the club and City or what didn't, didn't happen. Um there's certainly a mental aspect to that as well. Uh, and coming into the season under Nuno, it really wasn't the manager we needed in that environment, I don't think. There wasn't a personal connection he had with Nuno to put his arm around him and said, right, now it's time to go again. You've had disappointing Euros. You didn't get the move that you were touted to have wanted. But this is Tottenham. This is your club now, the club you've loved ever since you were a kid. Um, it's now time to put it in on the pitch. And it's, it's been spoken about that he was a touch touch overweight along with a couple of others when, when Conte came in. Was that a factor? Is he still recovering from that aspect? Um, his running stats are getting better, but are they good enough? Um, it's, an, it's a real interesting one and it's difficult. There's going to be plenty of opinions on him. There is a sentimentality to, to him being our talisman. Um, not a club captain, but almost almost your on-field captain or the guy you'd expect to, to sort of bring the team up a level when they need to. Um, and it's tough. It's really tough seeing him like that. There's you can hear it in the reaction in the crowd when he missed against Brentford and he missed the chip today. It's, there's an expectancy yeah. for it to go in. Yeah, it doesn't go in. And it's it's almost like a it's almost like your son's missed it in, in his under sixes game and you really want him to to improve again. There's that sort of connection we have with Kane. And it's uh it's a real tough one to see him. I I personally still feel he's got he's got a future here and certainly in the goal scoring centre as well. Um yeah. Conte really, really wants him to stick sort of within the width of the penalty area. And he's really adapting his game from dropping deep under, under Jose to, to moving forward in the pitch again. Yeah. And I think, to be honest with you, we'll see a difference if in January we get something behind him creativity-wise that's going to funnel him with chances. Um, and goals bring confidence, that's a cliche, but it's so true. Uh, and if he if he bangs one or two in, in a couple of games in the next couple of weeks, I think we'll, we'll turn a corner with him and, uh, and we'll start seeing a difference. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, Kane's had adversity the whole time he's been at Spurs. Let's be honest about it. And, you know, us Spurs fans, uh, we fought the corner for him on so many occasions where people would question if he's good enough. You know, is yeah. he the best? And how many times did we say, no, no, this guy is not only one of the greatest goal scorers, he's actually a great passer. I mean, well, he's always great right in the summer, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, I mean, this is why it... we're all getting so ag. Because yeah. we've fought his corner forever. Yeah. And now it's like... Even, I mean, even, even when it comes, 
even Sal, when it comes to winning penalties, I mean, how many times have we defended Kane for, you know, pushing himself, you know, doing that, you know, as we know, kind of that, that almost back movement where you're kind of buying a penalty, but we've always been behind him. You know, I think it's the first time for him where he's really now being questioned amongst the Spurs fan base again, where that first time, was he good enough to play for Tottenham? Um, it's so bizarre in a summer where he could have got a move to Manchester City that fell through and now he's got to immensely adjust again to now trying to just get yeah. scoring for Spurs and it's a again it's one of those that will keep on running um, but we've got let's say we've got we've got a lot to talk about still on the positives of course we've got delightful Davis we've got a uh, sumptuous Skippy as well and uh, before we do we saw of course uh, no surprise to see Matt Dodgy coming on um, for Bra- uh, for Spurs, we saw Brandon Williams tormenting Jaffet Tanganga. Now, Conte's 3-4-3 was being really tested in that first half with Regulon and Emerson. Um, and I think it's fair to say that for Tanganga, I mean, he struggled to offer much going forward as that game wore on. Yeah. He was exposed a couple of times down that flank. He ended up coming off on that hour mark. And I say we saw Oncom, Oncom Darty, we'll talk, talk about shortly. But um, it wasn't an absolute belter from close range from Damison Sanchez to smash it home for 2-0 for Tottenham. It fell to him nicely after a Son's corner. Uh, Davis, to be fair, we're going to come on to Davis as well. Obviously, won that flick on at the near post for Son. And there was Sanchez to smash the ball home. And I think Norwich at that point, coming around to you, Emma, I think they would have been really ruined their chances because um, at 1-0, I think we can all say, I think we were all a bit concerned about the way that game was going. And obviously, that 2-0, the goal itself from Sanchez was a real important moment in the game that you felt for Spurs, okay, having that cushion was massively important. Sanchez, thoughts on him for you, Emma? And overall, how important that goal was for Tottenham in the course of that game? Yeah, I think it's it's quite funny that Sanchez has scored the same amount of Premier League goals as Kane this season. Um, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the island of coming to the next one. That wasn't the little bit at all, by the way. That wasn't the little bit at all. Um, no, I think it was a very important goal. I did, yeah, I was speaking to some people at half time and I thought, you know, obviously we were one nil up and there were some good spells of play, but I thought, you know, I just I just thought that we needed to step it up a gear. And I thought, you know, against a team who have scored the least amount of goals in the league. I thought we needed a we needed a more comfortable lead, and that's why I yeah, as you said, I think that second goal was very important. Um, I think good for Sanchez as well. You know that his last couple of performances haven't haven't been the um, sorry. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that because I noticed that, and I yeah, I, I, nice. I, 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 I had a very intense. <laughs> my dad was like one bounce, my friend his head, two bounces. So did we. How funny is that? We're having the same discussion. <laughs> yeah. about so for, um, for all this of audio, just picking that up for you guys. So Stuart, such on the screen, it says, "Have you noticed the song bounce for the corners?" I think the number of bounces indicates the corner plan. Uh, Emma, to stick with you. Um, yeah. Are we any closer to understanding what the significance of the one bounce, two bounces are yet? Or is it just in case it just seems to be working? Let's just carry on how many bounces you want. Yeah, I, I don't know because <laughs> I, I looked over a couple of times and then it was, it was I couldn't count the bounces. So I don't know if he, the other two picked it up. But I did, um, he, he was saying that um, he likes a short corner because he backs himself to um, win against in a one-on-one situation. But I think, you know, getting it, you know, there's been there's been some that La Celso corner at Everton. You know, there's been some horrendous corners so far this season, and I think corners have been an issue for a while. But I think he's getting it in the box a bit more. Um, but I also th- sorry going back to Sanchez as well. Yeah, I think overall it was an improved performance by him, which I think was needed after the last couple. Um, you know, he's a bit like Bambi on ice um, last week. But um, I, I, so I, I, but I do think that second goal sort of yeah killed it off for Norwich and just gave a bit more momentum. Yeah, uh, so tell it to come around to you, Davis and Sanchez. I mean, it's been a week where we've seen um, concerns from the Burnley game of seeing you know many times Bambi on ice with Davis and Sanchez. So him putting in quite an astute performance there. Do you think, given time under Conte, there's a reprieve for Sanchez's future at Spurs, or do you just think at the moment he's only working? with what he's got in terms of the options for the uh, back five that he wants to field there? If he had all the money in the world and he was given, you know, a transfer window, Davison Sanchez would not be starting for Tottenham, right? I think that is blatantly quite clear. However, I do think consistently he, he hasn't been too poor. You know, I, I think, again, it's quite difficult to pick out players because I think everyone has improved at the back under Conte and I think Sanchez has always had that instinct that you know maybe Aurier Aurier had that he ruined right and had that stupid instinct at the same time Sanchez has always been quite 
you know, I'm happy to go for every ball. I'll stick my foot in. I'll make the calls. Like he's not scared of jumping and, you know, winning a ball, etc. And I think, you know, he's quite an aggressive player, which is quite good sometimes. But again, he's just an average player, right? He he is average. And I don't think, you know, he, he isn't the future. But I think, again, he's someone that always tries his best, I think. He might not be the most talented in the world, but he does try his best. And he does like going for the ball. And I think we have to appreciate that, especially from corners. He is one of the players that does kind of, I don't care, let me have a go. And I think you take that. But yeah, I think someone just said it as well. He has it. He's just not, he's not, you know, the best. And I don't need to really slag him off too much. He scored today. All the crowd was singing, you know, scores when he wants. And it, that's what he is, right? He's not mm. going to score for us, really. He's not the best, but... Yeah, it could certainly be a lot worse. He's no Matt Doherty, I tell you that. Mm. Let's come, let's come around to you, George. We're going to touch on the uh, the Irishman in a second, but before we do, uh, Eric Dyer, you know, another player I have to say um, that has really almost grown massively this season. I, I'll be honest with you, with Derek Dyer. I mean, I wasn't really convinced that he was going to be at a good enough level to be a centre back for Tottenham. And I always said in the summer when they're looking at Romero, I made it clear my views were if you're going to bring Romero in you're going to have to find a defender to compliment him because otherwise it isn't going to work. Why spend all that money on Romero if you're not going to give him a suitable centre-back partner alongside him? This is when obviously we're looking at, again, four at the back as opposed to five. Um, now when you look at it, I mean, Dyer is, again, it's, he's having a good season at the back, it has to say. You know, there's always been that concern about Dyer where there's almost that one moment of erraticness in his game over the course of the 90 minutes. But when you see his name now appear on the selection, George, are you... Less frustrated than what he was at the beginning of the season. Do you think now um, he has got a future under Antonio Conte? Yeah, I think so. I think there's almost an expectancy now for him to be in the centre of the back line. Uh, even when Romero was fit, it was Dyer alongside him. Um, and that's the third manager now that's stuck with him. There's a lot of people that, that don't rate him. You almost it almost feels like you're waiting for him to make a mistake. But you look at his you look at his defending and his the way he's the confidence he's playing with this season. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to see him being dropped. And I don't think there's a suitable replacement, certainly in, in our current squad, um, that's going to oust him. I think he's really got a leading in the back line. And from where I sit at the ground behind the goal, he's always pushing the back line up. He's in line with me, in line with me, very much leading the guys next to him. Uh, and you'll notice that he's, he's the most vocal by a long way on the pitch um, when it comes to shouting. We, you always say that Tottenham lack, lack leaders on the pitch and those that real sort of, get some tenacity into our game. Uh, and he's arguably still developing, I think, into a centre-back from, from his defensive midfielder days. Um, and he, he'll have his enemies. He does. There's a lot of fans that don't rate him. There's a lot of fans that say as soon as we spend 50, 60, 70 million on two centre-backs, he'll be, he'll be dropping out the side anyway. But from the here and now, um, and looking at him playing, and you'll notice when he isn't playing, um, the difference in our defending and how we defend um, is, is quite admirable, actually. And, and fair play to him. Because it's not been an easy transition, and equally playing under three different managers who have all picked him, um, and he's had he's had pros and cons all the way through. But um, full credit, I'm I'm fully on board with uh, with the diet train now. It's funny, isn't it, Emma? Because I say um, it's only I mean I dare and say probably start the start of the season, back end of last season. Many were just saying Dyer is not going to cut it, and even like I say as we record now, and this is the beauty of doing this live again, real diversity in the comments with many people saying, you know, give it time with Dyer, wait until the new year, very, very early to judge him. I mean, what do you personally think? We've heard the speculation Spurs, Antonio Conte still would like to add to the defensive ranks there. Maybe we'd like to cut the centre-backs. What do you think? Do you think Dyer will be one of the mainstays in his defence if we were to fast forward 12 months from now? Um, yeah, I do think, as George said, the here and now, I do think credit where credit's due. I think he's been good in that back three. Um, I think he is... I think he's a very good leader. Um, and, you know, I saw before about um, him speaking various languages as well, really helps sort of command that back line. And I think I think there is a case to say, who do you replace him with at the moment that that is going to do a better job? And maybe that's why sort of he's sort of... I, I, think he, I think he's been good for now, but I do think if, you know, some centre-backs are brought in, whether that's January or in the summer... I do still think he would need to step up another level to sort of keep his place in that in that back three. But I do think, yeah, as we've sort of all said, um, 
and in especially this sort of season and under Conde specifically, I think he has stepped up and he's doing well leading that back line, but also the organization, you know, when when they've got to defend corners, I see him shouting at players, telling them who to mark, where to mark. And I so I, I think that's needed on the pitch as well. So yeah, overall I think the here and now, I think he's doing a good job. But yeah. I do think it depends on who's brought in, whether he keeps his place. Okay. Talia, it's your time to shine. Uh, we're going to give a quick discussion on Matt Doherty. We're going to leave it sorry down to you this one for time purposes. But um, you know, many will say credit to Doherty because he cut inside and found came with his first involvement leading to a corner. Um, again, overall, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are. I mean, it was more. I can see the shakes ahead already going. <laughs> I'm going to be devil's advocate here. I, I thought that was more of a brighter cameo from him. But I'm the same as you. I think when January comes, he should be one of the first players that we're looking to move on just for the purpose that I don't think he's going to really feature regularly um, in an Antonio Conte team. When you look at what it's taken to get him to play today, um, obviously we had an injury, of course, to uh, obviously we had the injury to Regulon as well very, very early on. And where you see Doherty is so far down that pecking order now. Tanganga was exhausted when he came off as well. I have to add on that. Is it just the level, Tally, of where he's playing at the moment just isn't going to be good enough for where Tottenham ideally want to be? He's not a good footballer. You know, I don't know how much, you know, some of you guys know how much I hate Doherty and some of you don't. And it, it is semi-biased because I generally really dislike him. I will, to the small credit that you kind of said before, someone asked me how I felt about his performance today. And I said, it made me want to rip one eyeball out and not two. So that is like quite positive from me, right? So like there was a glimpse mm. where I didn't want to kill someone. Which is, is there an argument I tell him he needs he needs to run a game to not no. set you off? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't at all. I, I don't think he's a good enough footballer. He can play in the championship or play in the promotional sides of the Premier League if he wants. But he is not a good enough footballer to play for Tottenham. Right. Antonio Conte loves wing backs. We are never going to use Matt Doherty, okay? Right. I mean, someone said today as well, again, I've seen it. He is a natural wing back, right? The whole thing of him not being good enough under Mourinho or Nuno was that he should not be as part of a back four because that's not where his strengths are, right? We now play with a back three and wing backs. He's a wing back. He's not starting. Why is he not starting? He wasn't second choice either. He was third. There is a reason that he's third choice. He's not second, he's third. And he, again, you he came on because Tanganga was shattered. If Tanganga wasn't shattered, he'd have stayed on that bench. He wouldn't have even put a foot on the pitch. He's not a good footballer. I just really hate him a lot, okay? That old back yeah. to us, how you feel? I mean, Johnny yeah. Boyle is crazy. We should, we should bring Matt Doherty <laughs> to Brighton next week to leave him at the doorstep and run you away. You are so right. Honestly, I'll drive him myself accidentally go whoops out the car you go and lock the doors <laughs> he needs to go I think as well like, I am quite harsh I do respect that however yeah. most people hate Matt Doherty okay this isn't one of the Kane's a bit controversial at the moment Sanchez Dyer they're all slightly controversial I would say Mo and Winks sorry I forget Winks too Doherty if you like Doherty are you okay <laughs> are you okay? Well, well, let's talk about someone that um, we should all be okay with. And that's obviously Hum Min Son. I mean, um, coming around to you, George, I mean, he tried to make things happen throughout that game and he played that one two for Lucas to score his rocket goal. And then it was that corner that found its way to Sanchez for the second before the South Korean deservedly netted with a buried shot inside the box. Um, another good day for him at the office, of course, following up on the game midweek. And it's interesting with Son because um, obviously there's been this recent, maybe you'd say, expectancy or pressure on him where there hasn't been the goals. Now, like I say with Sonia, you're getting back into that purple patch. Is it just consistency, George, we need with Hummin Son for you? Yeah, I think so. There's, the jury's been out on him the last few weeks, and in, in, I think because we expect so much from Sonny, uh, he's he's always given, he's never let us down. Um, and But equally, I think it was more of a, I think against Brentford, we sort of saw a difference. He absolutely ran his heart out last Thursday. Um, on the pitch, really one of the better players um, in that game, and certainly today as well. I think I read a stat earlier, he's contributed to 50% of all our goals scored this season, um, which really sort of almost puts the proof in the pudding uh, in that sense. And he was he was excellent again today. You can really see him and Lucas, everything goes through them, really. Once it leaves the midfield from Skippy and Pierre, it's, it's Sonny and Lucas 
are the, are the main sort of instigators in going forward. Um, it's it's great to see. I think because we expect so much from Sonny, and last season sort of under Jose he had the stats sort of from from heaven. Uh, we're always expecting that sort of week in week out with him. But the fact that he's contributed to, to so many of our goals scored this year uh, is, is testament to sort of how good he is and how consistent he is already for us. Um, I think just we know his potential and how good he can be when he's absolutely firing. Um, but great to see, I think, him getting back to those sort of confidence levels in his own game now uh, in, the, in the new system that we're playing under, under Conte, I think. Yeah, spot on. Uh, em, let's come around to you because with regards to Son, it was a beautifully carved out goal from Tottenham. You know, playing that one-two, of course, with Davis and Skip involved there. Um, and it was a real great finish from Son. Uh, do you personally feel for you, Emma, with Son, is it a case where, as I've said to George there, it's just trying to find um, almost that rhythm to his game where there is that consistency and there isn't almost these purple patches because we know when Son is on form, is a devastating plan. He's one of those players that we know for Tottenham when Kane hasn't been stepping up, Son has always loved stepping up. Is it just fine that with Son under Conte for you? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think, as you said, you know, we know how dangerous he can be. He's already shown that this season. I think especially when Kane hasn't been stepping up, he's always been there. And he he looks he looks a threat in front of goal. He creates stuff. He has good link up play. Like I think I think he's got it all. So now it is just keeping that consistency and I think if he's able to do that under Conte which I sort of see no reason he can't I think you know he's already in the in the first sort of few games under Conte shown what he can do and I think Conte will give him you know the advice that he needs to keep that consistency up and then yeah I think it is literally consistency and then is the sky's the limit for him I know, Tal, you're, you're a big fan of Sonny's. Um, was it concerning you, Tal, the fact that we had that kind of dip where there wasn't the goals coming on with Sonny? Is there always a confidence to know that he will score the goals? Is it now, as I've said to the guys there, just finding a way to get Son to almost, as I've said, try and bring that consistency to his game? I think even last season we found it with Son where you were going through patches, you'd score five or six, then you go missing for a few games. What is the key to getting Son to perform every single game or is it the case that he's at Spurs for that absolute reason? I mean, I think we've debated this before. I know a lot of people have had the is Sunny world class debate because he's not always been consistent. And I know that is, you know, quite a re well renowned thing. I think Sonny is an amazing player. He loves it. You know, he loves the game. He loves Spurs and he loves everyone he plays with as well. And he loves the fans. Like he is just such a positive guy. I think he is knackered. As well, I think he, you know, we've said this again before, he plays, you know, most minutes of every game. He goes to South Korea and back. He's just such a busy guy. And that does take a strain. I don't think we should be worried. I don't think there is a rut with Sonny. I think he generally is just slightly tired sometimes. And I don't think we need to really speak too negatively of him. I think the only thing I will say is, again, it, it goes back to Kane. You know, that partnership is where a lot of the goals came from. You know, they had that telepathic connection. You know, it was here, this is how we score. When Kane's not doing those balls and they don't have that telepathy at the moment, there's naturally going to be less goals coming from him because he's not getting the balls in in the same way that Kane might not be scoring because he's not getting any of the, the goals right, I mean, or the behind play. So I think there is an element of that. But no, Sonny's a star and he is pretty much the face of our club now, right? Like, I think we've all kind of noticed that small shift when we weren't sure about Kane. Sonny is the face of Spurs, pretty much, and he's amazing. And for whatever reason it is, he's signed pen to paper. He wants to be here. He loves it. And yeah. we respect that, you know, we're all open to that. So, no, we love Sonny. No we negative there. No, no, I totally agree. <laughs> uh, we've had a load of um, listener statements coming. I'm going to read some of these out now. Sorry, it's taking this on to read some of these out. Um, J.L. Nils is on the game today. Let's not get carried away. Norwich missed a huge chance due to our poor defending. Stronger opposition, very poor team against Norwich. Would have scored. We can't do that against Liverpool. I think it's Tally said earlier. But many positives. The likes of Skippy, Lucas, uh, Sonny, thumbs up. Uh, Koss at CNK82 says, AC is getting everything out of these players at the moment. But that is three cliches out of four. Playing that pivot of Skip and Hoybier at home to Norwich isn't great, but must needs to cover the frail back line. Conte is the master. Imagine him with good players. Adrian Croft says, I worry against a better team. We may struggle with his formation, especially with the personnel we have in terms of current injuries. 
Um, he asked, do we need to change formation? I, I promise you, Adrian, we'll come on and answer those those, those kind of questions towards the back end of the show. Um, but a player we're going to speak about next, who, um, again, I've been told I'm going to be on best behaviour tonight, Ben Davis. Now, I'll just read you some of the flavour here. Uh, ben Taylor says, I'm so confused. Oh, ben Taylor says, um, I'm so confused. What is our best back five? Is Ben Davis within that now? MJB Hotspur says, can you finally give Ben Davis some credit for once? P. Giuseppe says, I'm hoping for some Ben Davis love tonight. I thought he was excellent. Chris Scott says, when will you admit that Ben Davis has something to offer this squad? Chris, I'm going to tell you something. This might not be breaking news to you. Um, I thought Ben Davis was finished up until Antonio Conte walked through the door. And interestingly, um, I think we heard, obviously, I think uh, from Ben himself, you know, the fact that he, um, as Pelequeta, he performed so well at Chelsea with him. And uh, Ben is not of a too dissimilar age. I think, again, I would probably say from a pace perspective, I wouldn't say again between them as much in terms of pace. But um, I think what Ben Davis does have to give Ben Davis credit is a footballer's brain. And I think that's why he really likes him. And he's a player that you can trust. He's dependable. He is reliable. I know in the past I've rated him five out of ten. But you've got to say he's performing above that at the moment. And, you know, credit to Antonio Conte. Credit to Ben Davis. And, yes, we can finally give some Ben Davis love in. And, you know what, it's funny because certain players, this is what you always find when Conte was first appointed, how many people turn around saying there's going to be surprises. You're going to have some players perform that you wasn't going to expect. And Ben Davis, as Mr. Malak puts on the screen here, um, the next world superstar at the age of 34. And, you know what, why not? This is what we love. This is what we love doing this show, right? Because um, we all want to be proved wrong. Talia, believe it or not, she wants to be proved wrong about ben, Matt Doherty. She wants to be proved wrong. And Ben Davis, I am being proved wrong right now. And, you know, good luck I to him. Be and I, wrong. Get rid of him. I'm being proved wrong. But, <laughs> no, I will say, you know, as a Spurs fan, we want to see the club do well. We want to see every player do well. So if a player is doing well, I will always admit, you know, I hold my hands up. And Ben Davis is doing ever so well at the moment. And full credit to him. And Emma, to come around to you, you know, um, I think Ali said it earlier today, actually, on his Twitter account. You know, the way he's taken to that left-sided role, you know, He's done it like you know, like a duck to water, and you've got to say he does bring even the attacking qualities that Antonio Conte demands. And I'll be honest with you, Ben Davis in the past we've seen him under Nuno, uh, Pochettino, Mourinho. Very rarely would Ben Davis get above the halfway line. Now he's bombing on. He's bombing on with confidence. And um, you can see there's a purpose to his game. How impressed have you been by Ben Davis? Uh, a revolution, really, of a player that I think a lot of Spurs fans would have felt he may be finished. Yeah, I think, again, another one, credit where credit's due. I think he was great today. I think he's been good, solid in the last couple of games. I think as well, he said himself, you know, the position suits him. And I think that is the key thing. I think that back three really works for him. Um, and I think, you know, he's obviously played on the left of a back four before. And I think he he suits more that back three. And I think, you know, he's been able to get forward and that's clearly obviously he's been he's been helping create some of those goals. And I just think I think he as as Conte said, you know, he's and as you said, Ricky, you know, he's got that footballer's mind. He's got he's got personality about him on the football pitch. And I think he uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I'm I'm shocked as well, but I'm pleasantly surprised. And I'm you know, I think he's another one that if he continues working hard, then, you know, it's he's being solid at the back at the moment. He's getting forward. He's helping the team out both offensively and defensively. So I don't think there's much more you can ask from him from him at the moment. No, I totally agree. George just come around to you because um I'm not sure we'll be credited with that assist for Sanchez, but you know, Davis has, has made both the Spurs goals in that half alone. And after going close himself and forcing the opener against Brentford, you know, remarkably, he's becoming an attacking threat, you know, not only defensively, even attacking as well. Are you not surprised? And I must correct myself here. I said he was 34 and he's not 34. I think he's 28, someone's put there. So I've just aged him by six years. So I do apologise, Ben. I know Ben's obviously watching this show. So ben, I'm so sorry. And um, for all the times I've slagged him off, Ben, ignore that. We absolutely love you now. And um, here comes the Ballon d'Or. What do you reckon, George? <laughs> yeah, it's credit, mate. I mean, it's it's arguably, if you could write the less centre-back role in a Conte system, you'd probably draw Ben Davis. Um, it's he's a, he's an excellent attacking centre back and not a very good attacking left wing back or left back. It's weird. It's the way he joins attacks late where the, where he exploits the space in the penalty area. And Sanchez did it uh, a bit later on as well, where he arrived later in the box sort of out of nowhere. And it takes defences by surprise. It's, it's really a perk of, of the Conte back five that works. 
um, especially with the wing backs. And, and he arrives late and he's got that footballing brain in that area, ironically, where he can find the spaces and he can find other players. And it, it, it's great to see. And he's been such a sort of stalwart of, of Tottenham, despite not making even that many appearances over the last sort of six years or, or whenever he joined from Swansea. Um, and he's he's one of the good guys and he's got a lot of stick totally over the agree. years. Yeah. Um, and I think he he had he had a brief sort of period where Rose was out under Pochettino where he actually did quite well at left back. I think it was the tail end of the 2018 season, perhaps. Um, and then went and then dropped out the team again. But now he's got a run on the side, he's comfortable, he plays there for Wales. Um it's it's great to see. Uh, I really hope he continues sort of against better opposition and he can find himself in uh, in similar positions. Yeah, it just feels so weird to be talking about Ben Davis and he's and, and I'm not, again I'm, I'm not that's not a dig at all. It really isn't a dig. Uh, so, like you know, Carlos at back. I know it's quite unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, where's this show going? Talia, to come over to you. Um, he's had more shots in four Premier League games under Conte than in the whole of the last season, three in twenty games. I mean, that's quite revolutionary. Even for you, I know in the past we've had our debates on Davis being good enough. Um, there's comments here still saying that many people still aren't convinced. I mean, are you convinced that Davis is going to be at Spurs long term now under Conte? Or do you think he's just at the moment working for the purpose that it is? Well, you know, controversially, I've always quite enjoyed Ben Davis. And that is controversial, Danny, especially you, for Danny me. Davis. <laughs> I've always enjoyed Danny Ben. Davis. I've always enjoyed Ben. And I don't know really why. I think I've always thought he can't attack. We've always known he can't attack. But... You know, he has been known as this Mr. Reliable guy. He's not yeah. the best thing since sliced bread. He shouldn't really be starting. But if he comes on or has to play, he does a job, right? And, you know, that is technically kind of known as average, <laughs> you know, to some degree. You know, he does the job. He doesn't really excel, but he does it. But he's always been quite consistent in doing that. And I think, you know, we've often said, you know, for Wales, he plays in this back three and is so much better than he does for us in his role and you know why is that and I think you know under Conte that has just become really apparent and you know he's taken up this role extremely well I think the surprising part is definitely just how attacking he has become um but I think it generally is confidence right confidence does wonders for some players I think there are players in life who want to be the biggest and the best there are players yeah. who want you know can go under the radar I think Ben Davis is really generally quite happy not being the most famous person in the world. I totally agree. He enjoys yeah, playing yeah. football. Yeah. He totally is, agree. you know, he enjoys it. And that's what he's there yeah. for. He's there to play football and not for anything more. And he's content. And yeah. I think he's been given this opportunity. He's performing well. He's become super confident, which is incredible. And, you know, why not build on that and run forward and give your chances? You know, you deserve that. And I, I rate him for that a lot. I think he's got a lot of unnecessary stick. He's not, compared to a lot of our defenders who have, you know, done really awful things. He really hasn't been too bad. And I think he's been superb and we all have to credit that. And I, I generally hope there is a future for him, whether that is, you know, consistently being in the first team or whether it's back to the fringe. I think he, you know, ultimately is happy with either yeah. and is enjoying the time he has. And I think that's really quite special, actually. Yeah. All joking aside, I don't think we sat enough on this show, you know, um, for players like Ben that have, Always given us absolutely everything. How I think many the, years the, as well. Yeah. yeah. The service yeah, over the course of the service he's Amazing. given us over the course of how many managers that he's been through. Um, that in itself deserves a lot. And listen, hopefully one day we have him on here and we get the chance to reminisce over playing under so many different managers. I mean, he, he obviously loves playing under Conte and may that continue. He said Conte after the game that Ben is playing very well. I think that role specifically, I can get the best out of him. It happened the same with Aspila Quetta. I need a player who has that personality and ability. And again, I mean Big words there from Conte on Ben Davis, and that will mean a lot to him, I'm sure. You know, um, yeah. Ben Davis, he's been around the block, but when Antonio Conte gives you that kind of praise, I mean, again, how can you not be excited? So, guys, there you go. I mean, I hope I'll say I've, we've, we've given Ben Davis there, you know, some lovely glowing words, and I'll never be told again that I never gave Ben Davis, again, <laughs> the uh, the not the nice treatment. Um, I mean, I've got to say, at that point there, I mean, I, I think at 3-0, we could all safely say that some of the football being played and seeing us create so many chances under Conte, He's only been here a month. And I think we can all safely say in the last three years, just how negative and how boring it's been at time watching Spurs. There yeah. is that real vibrancy about the place. So much that Tally is trying to play us a tune on some kind of background. If it isn't Siri, we've got the triangle in the background there. This is where this show's going. No, it's the chili it's the bottle. bottle. It's the chili bottle. It's the chili bottle. <laughs> what this show's doing to us. Uh, but there is a real excitement. And uh, just like I say, we've got to talk about uh, Man of the Match. 
and a comedy taking this long to talk about it, nearly an hour and a half in, but Skippy. I mean, George touched upon him earlier, but we'll start with you, Emma, on Skippy, because um, he plays almost like he's been around for the last three to four years in a Spurs shirt. And I'm thankful he hasn't played for the last three to four years, because obviously he'd want to move by now and he'd want to get out of this football club. But um, generally, the maturity and the wisdom beyond his years in a Spurs shirt. You know, he was man the match, of course, against Brentford midweek. Um, and today he embarked on that long run through the centre of the pitch within the first few minutes. Um, but again, it's just not just that. It's the numerous tackles, it's the numerous interceptions, and including that one remarkable one where he slid in, won the ball back, and still managed to pass it to a teammate behind him while starting across the floor. I mean, this guy is just... For me, he's, just, he's up there for me now in the Spurs team, where you look at him and think, if he's not in the Spurs eleven and he's not injured, why is he not being picked? Because he's almost the first name on the team sheet. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. I think it, it's quite incredible, really, that, you know... Um, I think that loan spell at Norwich really helped him just to get that regular game time um, and to help his development. And he's come back and just shone, really. I think it is as well. I notice in nearly every game, he's sort of, he's not afraid to go into those crunching tackles and he does win the ball a lot. And I think, you know, he's he's happy to get forward, get back. Like, you know, he he's happy to do it all. He, he puts in a 100% effort and obviously... I think that's the start of it. You put in that 100% effort and that development he's had at Norwich and that he's continuing to have, I just think, I, th I think he's only going to get better. And, you know, he's only 21. So he's he's got, yeah. how many years has he got ahead of him? And I, I just think, I think I personally think as well, it's helped him being alongside Hoiberg, um, just sort of having that sort of leadership next to him has also helped him. And I think now he's sort of, as you said, Ricky, like, I'd say, yeah, definitely one of my first names on the team sheet. So I think you can't really ask for more from him at the moment. No, and, and what I love about him, George, coming over to you, is he plays the game in almost such a humble way when he does speak as well. I mean, the guy is just class, isn't he? And I think, you know, Norwich today, um, and again, it's, it's typical, isn't it? He was brilliant for them on low last season. I mean, he gave them the runaround at points today and reminded them just how important he was for them last season. I mean, George, are you excited about what a player we've got on our hands is so young? And he's only going to get better under Conte, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. We've got to be careful not to put too much on his shoulders. I mean, there used to be that song about a team of Robbie Keane, so you're on a team of Ollie Skips at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it is exciting. I think his trajectory and how consistent, I think, has been performance after performance this season in the middle of the park with a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Um, and the jury's been out on, on Pierre on a couple of occasions on his defensive side of things and his passing. Um, and you'd almost argue in some cases that Skippy's sort of gone above and beyond um, sort of the performances that Hoybier has been putting in and occasionally. Um, and it's really exciting to see. And I touched on it earlier in the show about his sort of creativity now. Um, and even against Brentford, where he put Kane in and Kane missed that chance. But today, when he went on that run from, from deep within our half and, and, and got a shot on target off, it's exciting to see. And, and it's obviously a new bow to sort of his game now um, under Conte, I think. And we'll see more of that. Uh, going forward and even against better opposition I look back on the first day of the season when Nuno put him straight into the side against City at home and he was almost man of the match in that game as well it was yeah really spot. good fearless as um, as Emma said in the tackle as well exciting to see just got to be careful with him not to put too much on his shoulders hope he stays fit but as, mm -hmm. a, as a graduate obviously from the academy and a, a local Hartford lad for me here it's yep. uh, it's great to see him and, and how he's doing Totally agree. I think in your ends, he's. Oh, I'll say, George. I know your your uh, your ends very well. He's there is a heart for cheap biscuits, right? So no pressure at all. On Absolutely. The no. Absolutely. No. So I bought my shirt already. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, come to you. I'm sure you want to give some praise to Ollie Skip. I mean, has it surprised you just the way he's adapted so quickly to Premier League football? We have to remind ourselves. He's he's you know, only played a couple of times, of course, um, a couple of seasons ago. You know, this guy is still fresh to the Premier League and he's almost coming as if he's been, like I say, here for the last two, three years playing at this consistent level. I mean, and, you know, he's had massive praise from, you know, again, Mourinho, I know divided opinion. Mourinho said he could be a captain. Uh, Conte is now coming out and said he could be a top midfielder. I mean, as George is there, we've got to make sure he keeps his feet on the ground. If he's listening to this show, as we know he is, uh, Skippy, you're watching this right now. We know you're going to keep your feet on the ground. You're that kind of lad. Um, but what do you think, Talia? Do you think in a way that, you know, this will only give him confidence rather than going the other way? Because he just seems such a humble guy. He does. I, I I mean, he seems like a player that won't let those comments go to his head. And I hope it stays that way because he does seem to have all the talent and all the skill set. And like we said, he just plays with such mat maturity and like poise that you think, how has he only played X amount of matches? Like, 
he plays like someone that has played for years. And I think his ability to read the game is incredible for someone at that age. And I think all of his decisions just make sense. <laughs> and that sounds so stupid, but so many decisions, we as fans kind of just think, why did you do that? Like, what are you doing? But everything he does, we're like, yes, like, this is what I want to see. I think, you know, his ability to kind of slide, win the ball, and just like stand up again and just start playing is mental. Like that is a proper talent to see. And I think, you know, the last two games, I know for sure I've tweeted being like, Skippy is unreal. And I mean, he's one man in the match, what both games as well, I think. And, you know, it's amazing that we've all kind of seen that. And I think it's really shone a light on him because he has, you know, just bossed the midfield completely. And I think he's kind of felt that as well. I mean, today he had a couple of shots, didn't he? It was just like, all right, fuck it, let's go. He was just ready to shoot. And that is great. Like, I respect that big time. Um, because, it, like we said, again, confidence does wonders. And I think, you know, he's he's been amazing. And respect to Skippy. And I sincerely hope that, you know, we see a lot more of that, especially against the harder opposition. Um, yeah. But his tackling is amazing. And long may it continue. Well, I think that's the key thing what we said there. I think um, with the opposition coming the likes of Liverpool, of course, to come and the games across, obviously, New Year and into February, I think we are going to see whether Skip has that ability to, again, perform against the top teams. Or I'll argue, you'd probably say, I think when he came against Chelsea, um, he was one of our better players. Obviously, United, again, these guys, it's very hard to then give a judgment on players that really, um, in a team around them, they just simply wasn't performing to the task. But um, I'm very excited about the future. Um, we must just say Stephen Bergwijn came on for Lucas Moura later and who got a standing ovation for his performance. Uh, Bergwijn, some nice touches when he came on late in the game. But looks like he pick up an injury in the final moments after being on the receiving end of a tough challenge. Uh, I haven't heard anything in terms of anything after that. I don't know if you, Emma, have heard anything about Bergwijn at all as we uh, look to conclude this part of the show. No, yeah, I'm not I'm not too sure. It did look like a, a very crunching tackle. Um, but hopefully, yeah, he will, it seemed to be sort of hobbling a bit, but hopefully it's nothing too serious. Totally agree. Um, we also saw Hoybier down with a groin injury as well. And at that point, Spurs used all their subs. Uh, I think it's fair to say a less dominant performance from him than Skip, but he was still involved in plenty that Spurs did in the centre of the park. And after the game, Conte was asked to Spurs TV, you heard that interview earlier in our show, for instance, an audio of the fans singing his name. And he said, first of all, I want to say thanks to all the fans who sang my name. I'm very happy and enthusiastic for this. I feel a lot of responsibility towards the fans. They trust a lot in my work and to hear my name is good. And I think this is great at this point. He said, I've only just arrived, only one month, and I have that responsibility to deserve this name. I think it's too much. I want to show in the future to deserve this. Now, this is Spurs fans all over, isn't it? Because um, generally, I mean, we uh, we just know this guy is world class and... <laughs> Like anything, we can't believe he's here. So we just keep sticking his name. I think you have to get used to that. I mean, I will say Spurs fans, we're a very special group of supporters where um, if we like you, the unbelievable support you'll get. I mean, I remember when Soldado wasn't scoring in in the second season, we're still singing the guy's name, right? So, um, and the third season, we won't go there. We won't go down Raziak. We won't go right down there. But I mean, generally, like I say the support we give to the people that we absolutely adore it's relentless. And also after the game, uh, Dean Smith said, I'm disappointed and frustrated because our performance deserved more. Lazy punditry might say that it was expected, but anyone here would have seen we were in the game. And they were. They were more they were. clinical, but I felt at one that we were the better team. And you know what? Dean Smith's right, they were. Sanchez's goal mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. to say get the result. But um, we are going to go for our final break of the show. Uh, taking you into this break, you're going to hear from a podcaster very kindly giving us their thoughts ahead of Stade Rene. And when we're back, we're going to give you a quick five on that. For our watching audience on YouTube, still nearly 600 of you watching us live. Thank you ever so much. I said we're going to do a quick five on Stad Rene because at the moment, obviously, um, Team News is light on the ground here, of course, recording on the Sunday going into Monday. So um, you'll hear more about this in terms of, obviously, later in the week, which we'll be back to review the game. But um, to start with you on this, uh, Tally, let's come to you. Uh, Ren's going to this meeting following a 5 0 League One win against St Etienne. So uh, they're coming here, buoyant of confidence, and Spurs not only need a result, but also need another couple of formalities to go into their favour to even stand a chance of qualifying. Do you want to quite, do, you, do you want to qualify, Talia, for this? I think it's another controversial question. You know, I think, I remember, you know, for one, being on this show, having qualified, and we all, you know, spoke about it as, this is an amazing opportunity for our youth team, for our fringe team to get game time, you know, and we'll use the big players if and as when we need them. And, you know, it's become 
the opposite of that, really, if we're being honest. It kind of started that way, but it it's not. You know, we all thought it would be the Scarlets playing and, you know, trying to develop and just a chance to get game time where we're having to play Kane, Sonny and pretty much most of our starting players just to even, you know, get any form of result, which is not what this competition should be. You know, I think on one hand, of course, it is a trophy. However, I do think it is a bit of a double-ended sword. If we win the trophy, we're going to get taken a piss out of massively for winning this new, non-existent, worthless trophy. You know, so that's kind of, is it worth it? So I personally think the league is more important. I would, I think if our first team players have to play in this competition consistently, we will do better to be out of it. But I, and that's just a general fact. And I think the players will, you know, it's less game time for them, more chance to be, you know, we're again, like we've said, what, fifth with a game in hand, opportunity yep. to go fourth. And we've not even been playing very well. So if you think we take away those kind of games, we can focus on the league. Let's qualify for the Champions League. Why do we want to win a trophy to get into the Europa League? Like, we don't want that. But again, at the same time, it, it's a trophy. I think it's difficult. I personally look, Let's try and win the game. Obviously, you should mm. never try and lose a game. We win the game. If we win, cool. Let's go with it. If we're out, don't cry over it. Yeah, I think it's fair. So, I mean, we're also relying on Tower. Obviously, a lot of different permutations to go our way. I mean, George, coming over to you. I mean, in that match for A, they managed 56 possession and 18 attempts on goal with 10 of them on target. I mean, we're in for a fun game here, I tell you. And they're going to score by Martin Terrier, who got a hat-trick at Chimua. I got true. who also got on the score sheet. At the other end, uh, St Etienne got 12 attempts on that on that game, with two of them on target. Uh, Yvan Mahon with an own goal, the, uh, the scorer there for St Etienne. But um, over the course of the previous half a dozen clashes, um, Rens have helped themselves to the sum of 17 goals and have managed to score on each of the woes occasions. So um, it's not going to be easy this game, is it? I mean, it's going to prove to be difficult opposition. I just wonder, George, whether we do take um, our first team to, like I say, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium for this one, bearing in mind the importance of Tottenham qualifying. I mean, how high in a priority list for you is in terms of qualifying for this next stage of the Europa Conference League? Very low. Uh, probably the lowest in priority as it can get. And that, that, that opinion has changed ever since the last game, uh, really, against Enes Moura. I think, as as Pau sort of touched on, it was it was a trophy we could arguably easily go for at the start of the season. Um, if we could get through it with our our second fringe players and then bring in the, the first 11 sort of in the later stages because it was us, Roma and a couple of other A-listers on paper who you'd, who you'd fancy to get it through quite easily uh, without sort of breaking into a sweat. But it's not turned out like that. Uh, and it's just another game for us now. And I look across North London to Arsenal who are without European football, but in a very similar position to us in the league and the process that they're going through. Uh, and if we go into sort of February, March time with, with, with this competition still in our back pocket, I think it may be more detrimental than positive for us. Um, and it's not going to be an easy game Thursday. I think they're second in the league now. I need to watch Tino's PSG from, from yeah. memory. They're not bad um, at all. No. no, doing very so it won't be easy. I think we say this and we have our opinions, but no doubt Conte will want to win the game and will want to progress. I think that's that's the bottom line. <laughs> we can throw our opinions out there on how we sort of rate the competition, but I can't see us I can't see us sort of throwing the game by playing a weaker side, unfortunately. Um yeah. I just I feel like it might come back to, to bite us, uh, considering how we performed in, in the tournament today, unfortunately. But that is that is the case. Yeah, I mean, we uh, know ahead of this game, of course, Emerson Royale, Giovanni Lo Celso. Uh, I think it's an unknown. I've seen Royale, it's an illness. So, um, again, it's one of those, I suppose, we're going to have to wait and see in terms of how he does recover. But Lo Celso, Romero... Um, Romero, as we know, is long term. Littell, so who knows, maybe doubtful for this one. And um, for Rens, they've got some current player fitness concerns. Jeremy Galin, who's got a cruciate ligament rupture, and Flavian Talit won't be considered. So, um, as we understand the permutations for this, they're a weakened team. They've already well, qualified. I that's a good point. I was just going to say that, yeah, they've yeah, won the so group. So, they've won the group. So, they I think they their best team. Yeah. They don't care. So that like, that we, will have to do us a favour. I mean, that will have to do us a right. favour, right? Um, but, we still um, might not qualify. Yeah, yeah we might. Yeah, <laughs> <I think laughs> we might. Spurs, <laughs> isn't it? They'll play the weekend team and still beat us, no, no, no. Um, but Spurs, as we know, are likely going to need to beat Rens by two goals better than the Test beat Mora to qualify. Uh, they can obviously no longer win the group. I think in the extra round of 32 and also Spurs will go through if they, I say better Vitesse's result. And if both teams win, Vitesse need to improve their goal difference, which is currently plus one, the Tottenham's plus three. I mean, 
There's a lot of maths in here, right? So if Tottenham win 1-0 and Vitesse win 3-0, Vitesse would progress overall on away goals. I mean, my God, probably not the right mathematician for this, but Emma, to come to you, it's going to be difficult, isn't it? I mean, when you look at all those permutations to happen, I suppose not only have to win their game, but they're going to have to better the result overall. Yeah, I think I agree with what the other two have said. And I think the thing is, we can't play every game with this starting eleven. You know, there will be injuries. And I think if the fringe players aren't going to step up, I agree with George that it might be more detrimental in the long run. Because, you know, if we if we get another couple of injuries on top of the likes of, you know, Romero, like we don't have that quality in the depth of our squad to win game after game and that's why I think you know as Tal said you know it is a trophy a, a trophy that we all want like not that competition but you know we all want a trophy but I do just think there's that we've already had injury problems you know the likelihood is if this same if pretty much the same starting 11 are playing game after game they will pick up more injuries and equally you swap out a load of players for the fringe players and they've already shown that they're not you know, yeah. they're not making this step up. So, no. yeah. I just okay. think though on paper in general, right, like our aim, we want to be in the Champions League. That means we have to do well in the league. That has yeah. to be our primary focus. This trophy, the prize is to be in the Europa League. Even if we don't do Again. well enough to get in the Champions League, I very much hope we would qualify for the Europa League this season and not the Conference League, right? So the prize mm. is something... We should already we should get, get if better. not better. Yeah. 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 And I agree. Me why mm. it's got this question mark. And I just think, is it worth it? I don't know. Like, as we've all touched on already, I don't know. I don't think mm. it is. I don't think he's going to throw the game, but I don't think it's worth fighting over get rid. Yeah. But I mean, again, we have to put it in perspective. There'll be lots of Spurs fans shouting. I agree with on this point. You know, for a club that haven't what it's one trophy in 20 years, it's an opportunity to win a trophy. But I understand, you know, the exertions you're going through to have to get there it is a lot of games. A lot of games, which, I mean, as you guys all touched upon, it is going to get in the way already of a packed fixture list where, again, we're going to have to, like I say, schedule Burnley in at some point, which, again, isn't going to be easy. Um, FA Cup draw tomorrow as well. And George, like you said, the FA Cup draw tomorrow as well. So there's a lot of games to come. So I guess let's wait and see. Um, let's come to let's come to Emma to start us off on the predictions again, ahead of uh, Stad Rene to come on Thursday. Emma, what are we going for? Gosh, I'm, I'm going to stay positive and I'm I'm going to go 2-1. And I, I don't know the maths. Who knows if that will get us through. But yeah, I'll go 2-1. Two, 2-1 one. Two, one Spurs. Okay, Tao, let's come to you. What are you going for? Mm, I think if they play a B team, I'm going to be well, optimistic. I'm, I'm going to be optimistic and say we'll keep a clean sheet again, keep the run going. I'll go for yeah. it at 2-0. Um, but if not, I reckon maybe 2-1 as well or something. I, I think yeah. we will marginally win. I, yeah. I think it depends what team he puts out. You know, only Conte realistically knows how much he wants his trophy. And I think we'll have a good indicator of that as soon mm. as a team sheet comes out. If no, we're I'm, going for it, yeah. I expect a solid win because we should be winning. Yeah. If not, we'll probably lose and that's fine. I mean, I've got a genuine feeling that I think he will pick quite a strong team just to keep momentum going, right? Because I think there's a real no, positive around the camp. I think he honestly will do. Um, you know, Jay on the screen says Spurs have seven matches in the next 20 days. I'm just thinking, my God, that's a lot of podcasts coming. Uh, I'm going to have to start saying the word. I mean, we've got three at home in a week in two weeks. I mean, I yeah. look, thinking about going to the stadium and it's like, to all of these, you know, everyone's point, we can't play the same team yeah. in mm. every single one of those but I think matches. This is, this is why he said, isn't it, about the need to have to have the full use of the squad because you're going to yeah. have to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And this competition yeah. was meant to be for that, at least. Yeah. We can't even do that. So why are we no. in it? And, and I must just add to that point as well, Tal, you say there at Spurs, and we could also go into a playoff um, if we yeah, were we'll to, like I said. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So again, that was my that point. Would be, that would be another game on top of it. So um, again, we'll be we'll laughing to stock if we won this trophy. Like, let's be honest, right? The what the best possible scenario <laughs> one this trophy finished the trophy. But this would be so Spurs, wouldn't it? I mean, under Conte, he wins the trophy, we finish 10th and we're in the Open Conference League. Oh, do you know what? I'm not even going there. <laughs> we don't have to go home after that. I don't think anyone's going to celebrate that trophy, if that's the case. Not even Conte. I think Conte no. would celebrate that. George, let's come round to you to close the show. It's been a great show. George, what are we going for in terms of predictions for you? I'm going to go on Tal's tangent on if they play at BT, I'll go 3-1 Tottenham. 
Okay, three one Spurs. Oh. Uh, and also a point on the screen here from Vanessa who says for Test one six one yesterday, so they'll definitely go through. We've got a better for Test's result on Thursday, so we're not going to any more permutations. Uh, Ray Neil on the screen saying best show ever. Thank you so much uh, for all the support we've had this evening. Um, to two of our debutants, George. It's been a Danny Rose debut. Thank you so much, my friend. Lovely to have you on. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully we'll get you back on during the season. Pleasure. Thank Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Been been a great show tonight. Fantastic. And Emma, what a time to make your debut. You know, we don't always have to give the fortune of winning 3-0 for Spurs, um, which has been our record high this season of 3-0 for the Premier League. It says a lot about where we are right now. But uh, Emma, lovely having you on. And looking forward to having you back on again throughout the season. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Thanks all the comments and everything, it's great. And hopefully, yeah, be back on for another Spurs win. Fantastic. And before I do go to Tal very quickly, uh, George, where can we find you? I, I'll do this as well as Emma. Uh, Tal, where, uh, and Tal, sorry. George, firstly, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, Twitter, uh, at George Ban on my handle there on the screen. It's at, uh, at George Ban on Twitter. I'm very interactive on there, so it'd be great to hear comments on, on today and any, any other Spurs chat you've, you've got to throw at me. Amazing. Go and give George a follow. And Emma as well, of course. Emma, where can we find your content? Yes, so um, on Twitter, at Emma underscore Deduve, and um, all my pieces are on football.london website as well. Amazing. Like I say, we're looking forward to hearing much more from you, of course, across the season. And how also, of course, Talia Corrin. We love Talia on this show. Talia, lots of love for you in the comments. Maybe something disappointing that we didn't go harder on some of the players tonight, but Doherty got it absolutely ripped out of him. So uh, hopefully Matt isn't watching too closely and he's not watching you personally as well for the, some of those comments. Is. Please leave. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Honestly, well, no, I, it's always a pleasure. And I, I think something to point out as well is a few people were saying like, oh, we're, we're being negative or whatever. The point of this show, right, is we're saying everyone's improved quite a lot so yeah, far. Of course we, we are. Point out that, you know, there's still improvements and that's coming from Conte, not just us. OK, so no yeah. one get aggy. Other than Matt Doherty, he is an anomaly. We have no praise for him. Everyone yeah. else we have some praise for. But no, yeah, I love that bombshell. Him. Exactly. Yeah. I must, yeah, I I must say it. though, the, the results have been improving, Tal, because that says on the screen from Richard, not not too much swearing tonight. So uh, that's obviously an improvement. <laughs> yeah, way it's going the, it. Blame Ricky, you know. He brings oh. me on a win. What do you want? We're well, doing well. I'm, I'm I not try, too right? Negative. Come on. I'm I try, right? When it's due, okay? <laughs> Swings and oh, rounds. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Tal, where can we find you on social media? Give, let us know where we can find all your insightful opinions. Yeah, me too. Just freely on Twitter. Just come tweet me. I might reply, I might not. Depends how busy I am. No, I'm joking. I will always reply. I'm joking. Yeah, come follow me. I don't really use anything else too much. Um, but yeah, say hi. <laughs> Love it. Fantastic. We'll get Tal, of course, on again throughout the season. So uh, from George, from Talia, from Emma, from myself, guys, uh, keep safe, keep well. We are back with you for instant reaction on the back of Tottenham either progressing in the Europa Conference League I don't want to keep saying that word as well, or that sentence you're over Conference League, or going very strong in the next three competitions. As always, guys, most importantly, keep safe, keep well, and as always, come on you Spurs. Come on you Spurs.